You are watching Co-op for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois, November 16th, 2021, at around 11 p.m. And today we are continuing our playthrough of the adventure um, detective stories series. We're up to case three, which is Still Lake. Let me know in the chat, if anyone's here, if you can hear me and see me okay. It looks like I've got the brightness turned up a little bit more than usual this time, but let me know if it's too washed out or if it's okay. As a reminder, um, this will be full of spoilers. This is a story mystery game, so don't watch this if you intend to play this game yourself. Okay, we're just gonna wait for a um, acknowledgement in the channel. Hopefully Jonathan Warner is here. He's joined me for the last five or six playthroughs. Jonathan Warner is here. Jonathan does say maybe a little washed out. All right, let's take a little, let me go back to how it used to be. I'll just switch down so you can read the introduction while I change the video. All right, let's see. Here it is how it used to be. All right, let's, we'll, we'll stick with this one and we'll look at it later. Okay, anything, any preliminaries we need to get out of the way before we jump into this? This is supposed to be uh, the harder of the three cases. In fact, we've recently discovered there are four cases. Uh, Fire and Adlerstein, which we played and solved pretty much. Then Death in Antarctica, which I think was our favorite, which we played and solved. And now Still Lake, or Still Sea in the original German. And then there's a new one that's just come out fairly recently called Kaifeng 982, which is billed as a historical adventure. Um, 
and it has to do with some Chinese ascension to the throne or, or some mystery in 982 AD or something. So that's on order from Amazon UK. We'll play that when it gets here. If you'll remember, um, two of this series was licensed by an American company, University Games, which makes a series called Murder Mystery Party. This one uh, doesn't seem to be licensed in America. We don't know why, but we're going to be playing the English localized German version. We really don't know much about it. We know it needs the internet a little bit. And I will take this uh, moment to give a little plug for a video I just put out last week um, where I discussed this genre of game that we've been playing recently on the channel, which I've called Mystery Suspects Game, where you've got a bunch of, bunch of suspects and the, the way you're solving the case is picking out which of those suspects really did it. So I did a little discussion of the genre in general, and then I reviewed five of the games we've played recently including the first two in this series. What else should we talk about before we jump in? Um, I did um, purchase on eBay a copy of the rare out-of-print Sherlock Holmes Adventures by Gaslight, which we will also play on this channel. It'll take a sequence of three or four sessions. And it's sort of an infamous expansion. It's I, it may be one of the few expansions that hasn't been remade into the modern, as a modern expansion for the game. And it's supposedly very difficult and a little bit unsatisfying and frustrating, but um, a unique experience. So we'll be playing that. I guess we're ready to, to start. Um, all right, let's start. Uh, as a rem reminder, we just read everything. We take our time. It'll probably take us six or seven hours. And this one is supposed to be hard, so I reserve the right to pause and just sit here for half an hour thinking. All right, let's start. I've actually put a new top-down zoomed in that maybe will help you see things better. Can you read this? Here's a question. Jonathan, can you read this? We've got a, we've got the other close-up camera, which will look better since this is digitally zoomed. This is not going to look as good as if I move it over to the side here. But let me know if you can read this. It says, Dear Detectives, we're glad that you've decided to play our game. What you're holding in your hands is not just a game, but a simulation of a real-world scenario. You're not limited to the content of this box. You can use any object from real world around you that you think might help you pin down the criminal, e.g. mobile phone, internet research, etc. If you need more information about one of the game characters, check both the provided game materials as well as anything else you find appropriate beyond the box content. Please remember that you are the one to choose who exactly is going to be convicted in the case. Make your decision carefully. Consider the possible motives of the alleged suspects. Check all reference points, clues, and alibis. Handle the contents of the box with care. Damaged circumstantial evidence is not admissible in court and can undermine the prosecution's case. Tip, use this table, suspects, motive, alibi, proofs, alibi. Once you know exactly who committed the crime, enter his or her name here. At some point, if you don't know how to proceed, go to the hints. Um, so the hints in this game series are actually very good, and they're like listed in order, so you don't reveal too much. The way we've been playing it is when we think we know the solution, then we walk through the hints um, and stop if we get something that contradicts our theory. Now here are the contents. Criminal case, two pieces of evidence, photo, flyer. Okay, so um, as we've been doing, we'll sort of go through the contents of the case file first quickly and then maybe uh, read a bit and then maybe organize it a bit before we go. Okay, Jonathan says he can read it. So yeah, so just as a comparison, here's the normal top-down view, which is definitely hard for you to read. Here's the zoomed-in view. The advantage of this is that I can read it while, while, while you're reading it. The other view we have is the um, this view here, which is going to be higher quality because here it's not digitally zoomed, it's optically zoomed by the camera lens. So that's going to be 
a little clearer for you, more in focus. The problem is that it's way off to the side here for me, so it's hard for me to read that along with you. So if this works for most reading, then that's what I'll try to use. All right, let's take a look at what we've got here in our file. So we've got our case file. Now look what's interesting here. It's um, Carl Notebeck. He was in our first case, Fire and Adwerstein, 2019. Still Lake, Adwerstein, back in the same area, Adwerstein. All right, so we've got a case file with lots of documents. We'll look at that later. Here's our file for keeping track of things. I actually printed out so we wouldn't have to mess and damage any of the contents. I printed out a separate one. So we'll use this one um, and we'll put aside the one that came in the box. All right, let's look at what else we've got here. We've got a sealed DHL delivery envelope. We've got Carl's notebook. So, it, oh, interesting. Some evidence. More evidence in his notebook. Maybe we'll just leave it. Maybe I should have left this where we found it. All right, so he's got his notebook. He's a reporter. We've got some photograph with some writing on it. Business card. Press pass. Here's Carl's press pass. Don't know why we got a copy of that. A little brochure for yacht event. Translate a little Russian thing. Sounds like we're gonna. We probably should translate this. All right, let's put our evidence off to the side here. And let's look through our criminal file and see what we've got. All right, let's read this intro. Dear detectives, once again, I must ask for your help in investigating a crime. I'm under suspicion based on circumstantial evidence concerning my motorboat, which was likely used in the execution of the crime. The boat does indeed belong to me, but has been docked at the Adler Marina since October last year and has not been used by anyone since then, not even me. Please believe me, I had nothing to do with it. I'm currently conducting an anti-corruption investigation and I'm convinced that these accusations are an attempt to silence me so that those involved can continue to conduct their dirty business and manipulate voters. I'm sending you all of the documents that I've been able to assemble. I beg you, please find the real culprit. However, please remember that I am not an official representative of the authorities and therefore I do not have the power to decide who must be held accountable. Anything you discover must be presented to the police for further analysis and eventually to the court for a verdict. Carl Notebeck. So it's the same thing again with Carl Notebeck. He gets accused by the police and we have to find the real culprit. All right, let's see what else we've got here. We've got a uh, public prosecutor's decision. Okay. April 18th, 2019. This is when they're blaming Carl. Let's see what else we got. More from the police report. Some fingerprints. More police report, district court order. Okay, got a printed out Wikipedia page with a circled item. Don't know what that's about, diatom. Diatoms are a major group of algae, microalgae found in the oceans, okay? Autopsy. We don't know anything about what's happened here. And we've got some printouts. All of the games so far have used some kind of 
um, cipher type thing. So it looks like we've got another one here. Look, look at what he's look at what he's looking at. Pornhub apparel. Google and something else. Okay. Oh, we've got more screenshots printed out. Same computer, it looks like. Yet more printed out conversations. These are um, Twitter. Twitter posts. Okay. What else have we got? An article written by Carl Nobeck. Pardon me. Called a Detective Game. Uh, just a various article and a little ad for the detective series. And we've got football players. Okay, I don't know if these are real football players or not. Someone should let me know, maybe. Uh, yacht rental form. Photos of a passport. Looks like a Russian Federation passport. This is a photograph that it says in the corner is autopsy photo. We've got an autopsy photo and then a still lake photo. Looks like we're trying to be told this is this is bacteria from still lake. Then we've got a yacht map. Okay. Looks like got some tracking routes of yacht traffic. Then we've got a little, what is this? Looks like a screenshot from a web page or a blog. German Embassy in Russia rejection. Emergency call register. Okay. And then of course we've got Carl's notebook which has some stuff in it. Let's just quickly look through it. He's got a list of suspects. Notes. Notes. Then he's got a ticket, a boarding pass from London to Adlerstein on May 16th. Airplane flight. Freemason alphabet. That's going to be <coughs> our some sort of cipher. He's got a revised list of suspects. And we've got this little half of a heart that says your... I don't know if you can see that. Maybe we'll put it here so you can see it better. It says... U M P O R or P E R. You're my person, something like that. Okay, and then blank for the rest. All right. I don't know if it's important where we found this. I think we'll just take these out. All right, that's our material. Let's check in on the chat here. Jonathan says he has peppermint tea this time, did a quick search and looked like popular tea type in Germany. The sealed delivery envelope would be an issue for American licensed version. I don't know, but why don't we open it up and see what we've got here. So it says it's the sender is Oliver or Olive Shaman, Oliver Shaman. From Adlerstein. It's got a telephone number. In our last case, you could have actually called the telephone number and heard someone's voice. Uh, the recipient is Adam Nockland, also in Adlerstein. They want a delivery confirmation. All right, let's open this up.
Uh huh, I see. It's, these are security camera footage of a guy kissing a girl. There they are again, making out in the car. They sailed on yachts often, not far from where the body of Chernov was found. Okay, and this is 5119 from 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. Okay, let's see what else is here. Thank you for... Oh. Dear Mr. Nachlin, for the completion of the work commissioned by you, we charge the following. This is from Alibi Private Investigations. Okay, so it cost him $4,700 plus 20% sales tax on PI work. Total cost 5,600 pounds to get these photos. From Oliver Shulman. So, Mr. Nockland, Adam Nockland, commissioned this PI to take some, and he's got a photo here too. That's them kissing again. So, presumably, Adam Nockland has hired a PI to find out if his wife or husband was cheating, and apparently they were. Do we have a date on this photograph? It looks like it's probably the same exact restaurant. Yeah, same lights. Okay, so we just got a bunch of evidence of this, where this person was on this date. All right, let's put those aside. I guess we can put these all with this. Anything else interesting in here? No, just that he, Adam Nockland hired a PI to Find, his, find out if his wife or husband were cheating. All right, shall we read the notebook is a good place to start? Yes, let's just, I just want to look at this again. Um, he's under suspicion based on circumstantial evidence concerning his motorboat, which was likely used in the execution of the crime. So his boat was used to commit a crime. That's all we're told here. All right. Well, it would be nice to know, like, what the crime is. Where do, where do we get our, where do we start out? All right, let's look in his notebook. Was he investigating the crime or was he not? He says, an attempt, uh, I had nothing to do with it. I'm currently conducting an anti-corruption investigation. I'm convinced that these accusations are an attempt to silence me so those involved can continue to conduct their dirty business. So he's investigating an anti-corruption. All right, let's see what he's got. Um, this is from our previous case, right? Lucas Bremer, the Fisher brothers, Walter Sivers. This is our previous case. This is Fire and Adwerstein. So he's saying, done, solve this case. Okay. This transfer is crazy. I have to figure out what happened here. I don't know what that's about. Maybe we'll... It's transfer work transfer or transfer on a, a travel transfer. Okay, here's Teshernov. Teshernow. Teshernow frequently hangs around the social club Dorf Park. I have recruited a security guard, Raphael, to discover information about Fyodor in exchange for money. He is now my eyes and ears. Okay. When I came back from Russia, I noticed that my briefcase was stolen. It's just not my day. I discovered that the night wolves vandalized Fyodor's car. I have to take a closer look. Okay. Raphael complains that although the club manager paid the upfront repair costs, the manager deducts the amount from Raphael's wage. I had hoped that Raphael could shed some light on Chernow's last days. Maybe he saw or heard something. Unfortunately, he quit a few days ago as he didn't want to pay for the repairs to Fyodor's car. 
Freemason alphabet. So every letter, it's interesting, this is a very similar code to what we saw in the initiative, use this as well. And I believe I know how to read this. I'll show you when we get to it. Suspects for this case, the Fisher brothers are back. Adam Nachlin, Natalia Nachlin is crossed off. At Chernatal fan, I see. It's going to be a Twitter handle. Boris Razoral. That's it. Well, it's a little weird in this case that we haven't yet even found the nature of what he was investigating and the nature of the crime, although we did see autopsy stuff. All right, so let's look in here. This looks like a reasonable place to start. <clears throat> Department of Public Prosecution. The Public Prosecutor's Decision. In the waters of Still Lake, near the yachts of the Adler Marina Club, the body of Russian citizen Fyodor, Fyodor Tshernow, born in Russia in 1990, was found. It is well known that Fyodor had a contract with the local football club Adler. A few hundred meters from the shore of Still Lake, an empty boat was discovered. Registration number DESDA, da da da, under the name of Carl Notebeck. At first, it was suspected that the victim had stolen the boat while intoxicated and had died as a result of a tragic accident. However, this theory was questioned after the initial results of the autopsy. Based on the results of the preliminary investigation and on the recommendation of police, the prosecutor's office ordered a forensic investigation to be initiated in accordance with 212 STGB murder case. The case has been transferred to the Criminal Investigation Department of the City of Adlerstein. All right, so let's start our process where we're keeping track of suspects and other information. All right, so we've got Fyodor to share now. To share now. He's Russian. He's our murder victim. We also have Carl Notebeck. We assume that he's innocent. Let's make another card. So I'll use the blue cards for suspects and yellow cards for other stuff. So I'm going to make a note of his boat. P E S T A 399, etc. Okay, so for Fyodor, he was from the local. Football club named Adler. Um, body found in Still Lake. Okay. Jonathan says Carl's article might reveal what he was investigating. That's a good idea. Let's continue. I Jonathan had an idea last time, which has proved very useful to me in doing all of these cases, which is to sort of group the evidence together. So I've got some paper clips here for that. So here is our guy. No, we don't know that this is our guy. Probably is our guy. Where do we know our guy? I thought we had a photograph of him somewhere. 
Um, let's continue and let's try to organize some of this stuff. So this was May 18th. All right. Here's police report. State Office of Criminal Investigations. Objective investigation. Motorboat Mysterio. Let's make sure. I just wrote down the partial boat, but maybe I should write down the whole thing in case that's a, in case we get some situation where we get another boat. H798. Okay, so this boat that was found, Mysterio. Mysterio. Okay. A business card belonging to Adam Knockland and a pendant were found in the boat. Okay, so the business card and the pendant found in the boat. So these two, I'm going to put these together since they were both found in the boat. Um, no DNA traces were recovered from the objects. Comparison to the fingerprints found on these objects with the police database did not yield a match. Traces of the victim's DNA were found on the bottom of the boat. The fingerprints, like this, do you think this is a translation found on the bottom of the boat or do they mean like in the lower deck of the boat? Surely they mean in the lower deck of the boat. The fingerprints found on the bottom and s oh maybe not found on the bottom and sides of the boat are also not a match with any stored in the police database. Weird. Okay, so we've got a fingerprint on the pendant, a fingerprint on the bottom of the boat and the side of the boat. None of them matched, but also the victim's DNA were found on the bottom. So our guy has a business card for Adam Knockland is the party leader. And then on the back it says Jane Stable, the assistant. And it's actually got a website for us to check out. So let's make a new card for Jane Stable. Sorry, not Jane. Jana Stable. She's Adam Knockland assistant. She's got a web page, phone number. Okay, and then we probably need a new card for Adam Knockland. He's clearly involved in this. He's the one that um, he received a PI letter. Okay. This is Yana's business card, and she's working for, like, it's a little odd. Or it's Adam's business card, and this is just how to get in touch with him as you go through his assistant. All right, let's see, what else have we got? Uh, I guess you could combine these with this. Here's a note on Pyotr Chernov, born 513, 1990, Russian. Residing in Adlerstein. Petitioner. Carl Nopek is the respondent. The District Court of Adlerstein ruling by order of the judge respondent is forbidden to come with 150 meters to the petitioner. Limited till 2024. Respondent is liable for the cost of the proceedings. If there is no appeal against this decision upon request an oral hearing shall be held. So this guy, Fyodor Chernow, 
sued or filed a claim against Carl Notebook that um, keeps him within 150 meters. 11-25-2018. If you read the order, you'll hopefully come to the conclusion that I was merely doing my job. It's an important part of my profession to follow celebrities, especially inaccessible and elusive stars like Chernow. He had never given anyone an interview before, and I only wanted to be the first. This doesn't make me a murderer. You have to believe me. All right, so this, our guy, our newspaper guy, was tracking down, following Chernow, and annoyed him so much that he got a restraining order against him. So that's a different, we can put that in a different place. Let's put all these deaths, let's put all the initial information about this murder in one place. Here is the autopsy. Let's take a closer look at this. Jonathan says, I'm picturing a motorboat. Is it bigger? Uh, I think it's just a motorboat. I guess it's just a motorboat. It's in the yacht club near the yachts of the marina club um okay so it's just a motorboat um when we played the last case uh death in antarctica we got it right but we really got hung up on the lights going out at this camp and jonathan pointed out after the fact that we had made a I say we, I'm, a, I'm a lumping you in, Jonathan, with this mistake. But when we read it, I read it as saying that the lights in the whole base went out. And so certain things seemed very odd to us, uh, like the power went out in the entire base. How is this guy watching TV? But then on closer inspection, it was clear that it was only meant to be telling us the power went out in these two rooms at the med bay. So... It's a reminder, and especially with this being a harder case, that we have to be careful not to jump to conclusions. All right, let's look at this autopsy. Okay, time of death. All right, this is important. We need to, we need to get our bearings here. So, Fyodor Cherenow, dead, death on, four... 1619. So May, not May, not May, April, April 16th. Okay, and they've put the time of death at between 4 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. Okay, so here's our murder. April 16th, 2019, between 4 a.m. and 4.30. There. Okay, cause of death. Um, I guess we should write down that it was discovered at 11 a.m. Okay, so they think he died seven hours earlier. Cause of death, drowning from suffocation due to aspiration, pulmonary emphysema, fluid found in lungs. That's common when someone drowns. They look for food in their lungs. If there's no food in the lungs, then they know they were dead before they hit the water. This seems to suggest that they actually did drown. Composition enclosed of the fluid in the lungs. Traces of sedatives detected in blood. Blood alcohol, 2.2 grams per liter. I don't know what um, how impaired you'd be with that. So let's just write down, though, drowning. Sedatives. Alcohol. And then fluid collected. Okay. Unnatural death. They said, what was the original thing that said? It said we originally thought, it, at first it was suspected that the victim had stolen the boat and had died as a result of tragic accident. But it was questioned at the initial result of autopsy. 
So we haven't seen anything here that would lead us to believe it wasn't an accident other than the sedative, but traces of sedatives you would you could just be taking drugs. So why do we why are we so convinced that it wasn't an accident? I'm not sure yet. But I know that these can all be together. Let's put some of this stuff aside that doesn't seem like it's directly related to the death yet. Just so we can organize stuff. Here's Carl's article. Okay, let's take a look at that. What is the date on this article? I don't see it. It just says a view count. So it's some online report. When the smell of money arises, everything that was once promised will be forgotten. You can paraphrase Karl Marx's quote this way to interpret Adam Nochlin's execution of his campaign promises. Further investigation seems to corroborate allegations that politician and Adler football club owner hired notorious gang Night Wolves to intimidate his enemies. Let's make a new card for Night Wolves. This alliance has already proved to be deadly and another huge incident could be impending. Our supposed relentless warrior against the authoritarian and oligarchic Russian regime is currently engaged in a potentially shady deal with the very structures that he should be fighting against. The deal concerns the transfer of a Russian football player. Approximately six weeks ago, Nachland negotiated a deal in the final minutes of the transfer window to buy Russian footballer Fyodor to share now for his club. At first glance, this seemed like normal practice and there didn't appear to be anything suspicious about the sudden deal. Further examination of the transfer details, remember the notebook said, what's up with this transfer? So now we know it's a transfer of a football player. Further examination of the transfer details, however, reveals something potentially murkier than initially thought. The deal was brokered with St. Petersburg Club Neva sponsored by Russian oil oligarchs and under EU sanctions. The transfer fee is almost the same amount as the Adler Club's annual budget of $10 million, which is said to be an undervaluation of the player's worth. So, is there anything underhanded about this transaction? Is this supposedly upstanding politician trying to open the door to the European Parliament with one hand, while the other is busy laundering money for the Russian oligarchs? The role of the football player is unclear at this stage, and it remains an open question whether he is merely a puppet in this dirty game of bosses and money chasers or if he is involved. These games almost always end badly for those involved. I hope he knows that. Personally, I would like to add, we will continue our investigation. If there is any proof of money laundering, we will find it. And we will do everything in our power to prevent frauds like Nockland from infiltrating the European Parliament. So how does money smell, Mr. Nockland? Author's note, unfortunately, the police are delaying the investigation and a direct connection between Adam Nockland and the Night Wolves group has not yet been proven. Okay, so he's investigating Adam Nockland, who's a politician and... He's a politician and a football club owner. Okay, so what is he theorizing here? He's saying... There was a deal six weeks ago in the final minutes of the transfer window to buy Russian footballer Fyodor to share now. Okay, so he's paying 10 million, which is almost the same amount as their entire annual budget. But it's saying it's an undervaluation of the player's worth. I'm trying to, I mean, the idea of the money laundering is you have to, you're trying to figure out a way to make, the, get the money clean by showing it came for something real, so you might pay too much for something or pay too little for something. So he's saying 
10 million is more than they have, but less than he's worth. I'm going to, I guess we'll make a new card here for the transfer. It's from Nakhon to St. Petersburg Club. It's 10 million euro, which is their entire budget, but it's under value for Theodore. Under valuation of the player's worth, okay. Um, Jonathan is hypothesizing that maybe the Americans didn't license it because it would be hard for them to get into this uh, case of um, soccer football. Well, possibly, possibly. All right, we've got some documents of the football club. Documents, sorry, you probably want to see this too. Documents of the football club, documents of the yacht marina at the marina. I want to find more evidence. Okay, so these are part of the autopsy. So this is the fluid found in the lungs, presumably. Right? It says autopsy. Fluid found in lungs, composition enclosed. I mean, this seems to me like it's just saying these are, I mean, these look identical to me for all intents and purposes, which means he drowned in this lake, still lake. I don't know how that helps us too much more, but I'm going to put these with the autopsy. I'm going to put all the autopsy and report from the police in one paper clip. All right. Here's yacht. I guess we can put the yacht. Maybe the yacht stuff goes with that as well. Um... So let's take a look at this. What do we got here for our yacht? The death was on 4th 16. Okay, what have we got here? So here's um, yacht tracking from midnight 415 until 417. At midnight. Let's see what we got. So here are the different boats. These are sailboats. So what have we got here? We've got a bunch of different sailboats. These look like the different boats. One, two, three, four. All right. Don't know quite what to make of this yet. Um, here are people renting spots in the marina for the week of four, for the week in question. There's the escape, the destiny, the spirit, the Andiamo, and the moon. Who rented them when they started renting? Deposit 
end of final rental. And they got their money back. All right. Let's put these two together. I'm not sure what to make of that information yet. I'd like another police report to confirm that this guy... Oh, well, here's a call record for the lake. Emergency call. Let's take a quick look at this. On this, on 416, from midnight till 6 a.m. So this is our murder, our death occurred, we think, at 4 a.m. So here we go. Here's our 4 a.m. times, but let's look. Wow, I wonder if we have to call any of these phone numbers. That would be... <laughs> That would be a reason not to localize it in America if you have to make all these local calls. Um, all right, well, let's keep looking here. Uh, how old was our guy, Fyodor Chernov? We were told his... Um, we were given his date of birth, but I didn't write it down. Where was that? Oh, probably in the, in his autopsy. Let's just take a quick look at that so we know his age. Okay, so Fyodor Chernov, his date of birth. His date of birth here is 5-13. 90. Okay. So on the nine by 2019, he was 29 years old, about 28 or almost 29. Okay, 29 years old. Let's see what if we've got any calls about him, etc. Um Okay, let's look here. Uh, location in Adwerstein. So that's where, no, that's where he lived. He lived in Adwerstein. And where was he found? Near the yachts. In the waters of Still Lake, near the yachts of the Adwer Marina Club. Okay. So, well, I don't know if we need to know any of this information of where other places, but maybe later. But if we just look at Adwerstein for a second, what do we see here? Drug overdose, severe vomiting, labor pains, car accident. 19 year old man. Alcohol intoxication. All right, nothing jumps out here to me yet. But let's put this with the boat information. I'm um, just collecting some evidence here together. It looks like we've got reasons for rejection of a Shenzhen visa. I don't know if these are related. This is a little bit of a weird one. All right, let me let me organize this stuff a little bit better. So there's Carl Notebeck's press 
car, press a pass, and it's it's to this conference, Future of Germany, where Adam Nachland is the party leader. All right, we should translate this. Uh, the wiki article, Jonathan says, about the bacteria is probably related to the autopsy. I mean, yes, for sure it, uh, for sure it must be. Let's take a look at it. Diatoms. Microalgae, major group of algae micro found in the oceans, waterways, and soils of the world. Living diatoms make up a significant portion of Earth's biomass. They generate 20 50% of the oxygen on the planet. Half of the organic material found in the oceans. The shells of dead diatoms can, release, can reach as much as a half mile deep on the ocean floor. There's their structure. Here's light microscopy of a living diadem. And when we look at our pictures, seems like that's what we're looking at, I'm guessing. Now, how is this useful for us? Two to 200 micrometers, yellowish brown chloroplasts, cytophotosynthesis, often referred to as jewels of the sea or living opals due to their optical properties. Diatoms build intricate, hard but porous cell walls. And then this is circled here. What is this? Forensic. The main goal of diatom analysis in forensic is to differentiate a death by submersion from a post-mortem immersion of a body in water. Laboratory tests may reveal the presence of diatoms in the body. Since the silica-based skeletons of diatoms do not readily decay, they can sometimes be detected even in heavily decomposed bodies as they do not occur naturally in the body. If laboratory tests show diatoms in the corpse that are of the same species found in the water where the body was recovered, then it may be good evidence of drowning as the cause of death. The blend of diatom species found in a corpse may be the same or different from the surrounding water, indicating whether the victim drowned in the same site in which the body was found. Well, I mean, that's just what we assumed. We assumed that if this is the contents of his lungs and it looks identical to the lake, then that's where he drowned. Nothing surprising there. All right, let's put this with our autopsy stuff. This is a little weird in that I feel like we're like we're it's pretty slim on the police files against Noteback. Like before he was arrested, he was about to be. This one, it's just like, well, it doesn't feel like they have enough to suspect him just because it's his boat. And furthermore, I'm not quite sure I understand what the conclusion of here. It says, at first, we suspect that the victim had stolen the boat while intoxicated and had died as a result of a tragic accident. However, the theory is questioned after the initial result of the autopsy. Why does the autopsy not make them suspect that he just fell over and drowned? All right. Jonathan says, look again, I think the little thin diagonals were the only were only in one water picture. Okay. All right, let's look. 
Jonathan says if we look at this, which is light microscopy of living freshwater diatom, and then we look at this compared to the, okay, <laughs> Jonathan is exactly right. So look at this. I'm looking at these saying they look identical, but look, look what Jonathan is pointing out. These diagonal, these sharp little needle lines are not in this picture. Okay. So you are right. That is a difference. So these are only in this picture of Still Lake, but not in the fluid of the lungs. Okay. So I guess these aren't the diatoms. These, these aren't the diatoms. These are the diatoms. These tiny little thin diagonal lines. Okay. Well, that kind of changes everything, doesn't it? All right, so now we know why they suspect he didn't just drown there. It was some other part of that lake, probably where he was drowned. Still looks like he was drowned in the lake, but not in that specific area. So maybe in one of the other areas of Still Lake. And then boated over here. So if we look at uh, Adwerstein, which is here, right? So if this is the Adlerstein Marina, then we're thinking maybe he was drowned one of these other places and then they took that boat over here. What was the... Near the yachts, the body was found. Okay. A few hundred meters from the shore of Still Lake. Okay, so this is important. He's not found on the boat. He's just found in the waters of the lake near the yachts of the marina club. So the body is found in the water here somewhere. A few hundred meters from the shore is an empty boat. And it's Carl Notebeck's boat. Fine. Okay. Um, does Carl say that he keeps his boat near the marina? Let me just see here. He says, the boat does belong to me, but has been docked at the Adwer Marina since October of last year. Okay, so he's saying his boat was there at the marina, docked somehow... It's gotten free, empty boat near the shore, a few hundred meters away. And then we've got a log of the marina. Boats at the Adwar Marina. Let me just look at this for a second. There's a uh, stable. This Andiamo stable. Stable was the last name of the person who is, is the assistant of the business card, right? So that's interesting. That's a little bit of a connection there. Maybe we'll write that on our on Jana's card. 
so the yacht on the ammo um but what else would this tell us i just want to make sure i understand this part jonathan says there's also a boat with no real route in its own little lake kind of jumps out at me let me see what jonathan is talking about here you mean this one here this is just a marina i believe i believe the sailboats are the the marinas so I think it's just telling us there's rain here. But yes, you've got a good point. Uh, but there's no traffic at that marina. So if we're to believe that this map would catch it, then no one was in here during this period. Now, these look like these are telling us the different one, two, three, four. We've got a red, a black, a green, and a blue. So I'm thinking that each color is a boat that's made a route. So let's just see if we can understand this. I'm not sure the color has come out. Duke of Zill is here. He says, any chewing gum in this set? No. In fact, the little, the props for this game are pretty... Um, minimal. Okay, let's just make sure you understand this, because I think this is giving us the boat ID number that maybe we could look up. IMO or MMSI, I'm not sure which one, but I think these are going to be boats. So this boat left Adwerstein at 304, from 304 to 440, they went from Adwerstein to AGN which is going to be Agnesdorf. So this boat is one of these three. Where did it go next? It went from AGN to Tsar here. So it's blue, the, it's the black boat. So up top, I don't know why these aren't color coded, but we've got the black boat, it's going to right here, Boat tracking. So the first boat is the black boat. Goes from Adwerstein to Agenshof to Zargen back to Adelstein. Adwerstein. That's the black boat here. Okay. Then we've got next goes from Adwerstein to Rantau. So that's going to be the green boat. Is this one here. Adlerstein to Rantau to Zargen back to Adlerstein. There's the green boat. Next boat goes from Adlerstein to Agensoff to Albrechtstau. Albrechtstau. That's the red boat. And the last boat just goes from Adlerstein to Kronstadt, back to Adlerstein. That's the blue boat. Okay, so let's just make our little chart so it's easier for us to see this. Adlerstein to AGN to Tsar. Adwerstein. The green boat went from Adwerstein to R A N to Z A R back to Adwerstein. Adwerstein. Okay. The red boat went from Adwerstein. To AGN to ALB to ZAR and back to Adorstein. 
And then the blue boat went from Adverstein to KRO, then back to Adverstein. We can look at Jonathan says, just to double check, these boat voyages can take place from the 15th to the 17th. That's right. It can take place right as it turned the 15th from the night of the 14th. So midnight just as it strikes. So the entire duration of the 15th, the entire duration of the 16th, and the entire duration of the 17th. Three full days. But... We've got times here, so we can identify which boats could have been at the Adwerstein uh, Marina at the time of death. But does that matter to us? Let's just think. No, because we believe he was killed somewhere else, right? So what we, but we do know when his body was found. I think it said 11, didn't it? When did, when did we hear, hear where it was found? Yes, time of discovery on the 16th at 11 a.m. So the question for us from these yachts is can we pinpoint the boat that dropped him off here? So if it was found at 11 a.m. on the 16th, Let's see if we can find, what are we looking for? We're looking for boats that were in Adlerstein before 11 a.m. on the 16th, right? But is there any, they were all in Adlerstein on the 15th. Can we, uh, is that irrelevant for us? It, the body couldn't have been in the lake since the 15th, right? Does anyone tell us how, how long the body could have been in the lake for? It would be nice to know an earliest date that they could have dropped it there. Let's at least indicate what times they, what date and time they were in Adverstein. So all of them start out in Adverstein, or at least that's when the re when this record starts. So they were all in Adverstein on the fifteenth. But now let's look at the other times. This guy, the black. Let's look at this together. The black boat here. comes back to Adwerstein on the 17th. So unless he dropped the body off on the 15th, this is not our guy. He didn't come back till late on the 17th. Where does it say when they're found again? On the... 16th at 11, right? Okay, so let's look at this next boat, the green boat. He comes back again on the 17th. Okay. What about the red boat? The red boat back on the 17th. Okay. What about this boat? The blue boat is back in Adlerstein on the on the 16th, but at 4 p.m. Well, uh, here's another way to think about it. Jonathan says, I think they had an estimated time of death. Assuming someone was not storing the body for days, I would just go off the autopsy. That's a good point. We know the date of 
death was 4 a.m. So he died at 4 a.m. And then body found at 11 a.m. So he had to be murdered at 4 a.m. And then somewhere between 4 a.m. and 11 a.m., he was brought to the the lake where he was found. I was thinking another thing that um, we could think about from the, these times is if there's anyone that took too long to go from place to place. Like if they started on their voyage, but it took them longer than it should have, maybe that's something suspicious. But just going from date of death If the date of death, if, if he died at between 4 and 4.30, okay, so if you're this blue boat, it means you had to, he had to be killed in Kronstadt but after 3 a.m. and then taken from Kronstadt to ADL and dropped off no, he didn't leave Kronstadt till 11.32, so that doesn't make sense. Couldn't have been the blue boat, right? You have to be killed in Kronstadt, somewhere between Kronstadt, but he didn't leave Kronstadt. This boat was in Kronstadt from 3 a.m. to 11.30, so it can't be them. They can't be involved in this. All right, what about this boat? Where were they between, that's the way to say it, where were they between 4 a.m. and 11 a.m.? Okay, let's look at this boat here. This is our red boat on a path. So, between the night of the 15th and the morning of the 16th, they were in ALB, Albic trial. So they were off scene during the, between the murder and the time the boat was found. And they were somewhere between Albrecht and Zargen. All right, next boat, green boat. Well, this boat was docked in Zargen on from the night of the 15th till the morning of the 17th. So that puts the green boat in Zargen. All right, what about the black boat? Well, the black boat leaves AGN at 9.22 a.m. on the 16th. So they were in AGN from the murder to our time. So none of these boats seem to be good candidates. Unless I'm misunderstanding something, which I could very well be. But from what I can see so far, um, at least on my initial glance, these are not... These are not immediately helpful for us. Although, could have been dropped off the boat and floated here, we don't know. But nothing jumps out at to me as being useful. Jonathan says, um, Refresher's DNA was found in Carl's boat. Okay, good. Let's, let's look at that. A business card in the boat. They found a business card... This is the boat that belongs to Carl Notebeck. A business card belonging to Adam Nockland and a pendant. No DNA traces were recovered from the objects. Comparison of fingerprints found on these objects with the police database did not yield a match. 
Traces of the victim's DNA were found on the bottom of the boat. The fingerprints found on the bottom and sides of the boat are also not a match with any stored in the police database. So we've got a fingerprint on the pendant, a fingerprint on the bottom of the boat, a fingerprint on the side of the boat. They're all different. But the victim's DNA was found on the bottom of the boat. In addition. Let's see what else we've got here. Be part of a great yacht event on Sargent Island on the 16th of April. Visit adwarmarina.de to book a yacht. So we probably want to visit... Oh, you want to visit that website and see what if there's anything. But that's why they were all, I guess, why these sailboats were at Zarjan. What have we got here? It would be strong, strange for them to do that. The Fisher brothers were recently released from prison after serving a sentence for assault. There's Raphael. That was the guy in the notebook that Carl hired. Dorf Park security guard. Let's look at... Uh, let's go through the rest of our documents here before we get too carried away. We've got another website here and a, a Russian translation that we should do. It's not clear how to, you know, you, you could scan it for a translation, but how do you type that into an American keyboard? All right, let's see what we've got here. After a whirlwind summer of romance, sleazy politician Adam Nachman and his 31-year-old girlfriend Natalia Nik Nikitina tied the knot with a predictably lavish wedding. The guests, a number, of, a number of which would make Queen Victoria herself green with envy, gathered in a luxury, luxurious country house owned by Adam. He's got a pool. Um, the young woman pledged in her vows to create a comfortable home and wait dutifully for her husband, who was often away on business. The wedding dress, which would trump even the likes of Meghan Markle, was embellished with thousands of sparkling... Swarovski crystals. The dreamy gown will, no doubt, be included in the most stunning couture dresses of the year. Keep in mind that Adam, who is a council member in the North Rhine-Westphalia, is notorious for his often radical, scandalous comments. Perhaps his new bride will be able to temper his behavior and steer him towards a more moderate stance. Okay. We don't have a date, but we know they got married. All right, let's just look at more stuff here. We've got a passport, a Russian passport from Boris Razorow. Anything else of import in this here? Boris Razorow, we've got his date of birth, visa application to St. Petersburg, and then what is this? Reasons for rejection. The German embassy in Russia is denying someone a visa. It's a Shenzhen visa. Is that a, does that mean a visa to go to China? Shenzhen? Is that not in China? All right, well, we'll deal with that in a second here, but reasons for rejection. False counterfeiter forged document was presented. Maybe it's this document which is forged. The aim and conditions of the presence have not been proved. You have not proved that you have sufficient means of subsistence for the duration of the intended stay or the return to your country of origin. 
or for the transit to a third country or that you are unable to obtain such means lawfully, you have already stayed for 90 days in the territory of the member states during the 180-day period on the basis of a uniform visa or visa with limited territorial validity. You have been included in the Shenzhen informational system for the purpose of refusing entry. One or more member states consider that you are a threat to public policy. Proof that you have adequate and valid travel health insurance has not been provided. The information provided on the purpose and conditions of the intended stay was not credible. Your intention to leave the territory of the member states before the expiry of the visa could not be established. One-term refusal of tourist visa. C2. Okay, so we've got a code here. He was rejected. So this is what him being rejected for visa. D1 C D1 Refusal to issue a Shenzhen visa in this category with any number means you have been expelled from the territory of the European Union in the past. The expulsion is usually the result of breaches of passport and visa regulations. I'm a little unclear how to read this. Like it's D1 or C1. Denied C1. One time refusal for a tourist visa, term restrictions for one year. That's, if I had to guess, I would guess it's C1 is the code. D1 would be, this would be circled. But then it says check visa status, log in. So he's got his username and password. So we're going to be able to check his. Uh, visa status at this website. Although it's not clear to me where Shenzhen is. Like I guess we could search that. I, I'm thinking it's China, but uh, maybe it's a different Shenzhen. Okay, these are definitely go together though. Let's look at the notebook again, given our new new information. And let's see if anything jumps out at us from the notebook on our second pass through. Shenzhen. Who's the, okay, so Jonathan says, so they ran over the body with the boat. If they ran over the body, wouldn't you think there would be some injuries in the autopsy? Like they found his DNA at the bottom of the boat, but um, there would be lots of bleeding and cuts. Don't you think if they ran over some with a boat? Okay, look, we're going back through his notebook here. The transfer is crazy. I have to figure out what happened here. Okay, fine. Frequently hangs around the social club Dorf Park. I have recruited security guard Raphael to discover information about Fyodor in exchange for money. Okay, so that's our Raphael with his Dorf Park security guard outfit. So our guy recruited him. When I came back from Russia, I noticed my briefcase was stolen. Okay. The night wolves vandalized Fyodor's car. I have to take a closer look. Raphael complains that although the club manager paid the upfront repair costs, the manager deducts the amount from Raphael's wage. So he hired this guy to, to, to follow Fyodor and be on his be his eyes and ears, um, and then someone smashed up Raphael's car. I hope that Raphael could shed some light on Chernoff's last days. Maybe he saw or heard something. Unfortunately, he quit a few days ago as he didn't want to pay for the repairs to Fyodor's car. I see. So this is Fyodor's car. That somehow Raphael is being charged for because he's supposed to be the security guard. 
Okay, Freemason alphabet that we'll have to use when we see something. Here are our suspects given by by um, Carl Nopek. So let's add the ones we haven't added. So Fisher Brothers again. Adam Nockland. Natalie, um, okay, so then another suspect he's listed is this Twitter person, at the Share Now fan. We can look at their Twitter post. And then the last person that he's listed here as his suspect is this guy who was denied the visa. which we don't know why he'd want to do anything. And that's it. Okay. Well, we've been going for an hour. I think this would be a good time to take a break. Um, Jonathan asks, it's a visa to the EU. It says visa application to St. Petersburg on 23 December 2018. So, I don't know what to make of that. I think he's denied access to... Well, where is uh, Shenzhen? Member states. So, the German embassy in Russia. Does that mean he's trying to come to German? Germany? Is Shenzhen, is Shenzhen a German state? I guess it is. He's going to the German embassy to travel to Germany, I guess, in 2018. But we can check um, his information on the website and find out where he is, possibly. Um, I guess maybe before we have our... No, let's take a little break now. Shenzhen is a symbol of EU. Okay, Jonathan thinks it's an EU. That might make some sense. I see we've got some ciphers in here. All right, let's take a little five minute break. We'll refresh our drinks, clear our heads, and go back and continue through the documents. So I will see you in five minutes. And let's go out properly. Five minutes.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Call for Two. Jonathan is giving a comment on this visa denying, and he's saying, the way I'm reading it is Russia denying Boris from visiting the EU for one year. <clears throat> I agree it's a one-time refusal of tourist visa. It's the German embassy in Russia denying a, a visa for visiting the EU. Um, I think that makes sense, although I'd like to look up Shenzhen and understand where that is. So maybe let's do that now. All right, let's switch over here and Let's search for Shenzhen. Is it an area of Germany? A Shenzhen tourism visitor to Germany is a visa established by the Shenzhen states, which allows its holder to visit Germany and all of the 26 Shenzhen member countries. It is issued in the form of a sticker affixed to the passport of the traveler. So it's a German. A Shenzhen visa is a visitor visa to Germany. I'm not sure what the interesting, the Federal Republic of Germany. I'm not sure where the term comes from. It's kind of interesting. Is, Shen, is Germany a Shenzhen country? Here we go. The 26 Shenzhen countries are Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, etc., etc. Okay, so it's a it's a conglomerate in Europe, a set of countries, Shenzhen area. There you go. Well, we learned something new. Okay, so it's a. Uh, He's denied a visa, not allowed to come into the Germany for what we care about, Germany, for one year on December 2018. So if that's true, that puts him ineligible to be in Germany um, today. I mean, through, the, through, the, through 2019, the day of the murder, he, he wasn't allowed to be in. Um, but we can check his visa status, and since we're at the laptop, we might as well go. Um, let's go to this website and see if we can check in on this guy. www.tvwussland.de Okay. All right, German Embassy in Russia. Is this the real German Embassy? <laughs> Employee login. Okay. Can you, can you guys see this? Sorry. So here we are. Okay. This is a note that this guy left to himself. Sorry. This guy who's denying the visa left a note or something. This He's telling himself, check, your, check my visa, check his visa status. And is reminding himself of the login information or something. So I'm going to put this login information in this official looking website. Okay. Okay, username D. Whoops. TV. Is that a capital B E N? UTZR 075 EER Berlin 1759. That's how I read it. Okay, here we go. Look at this. <laughs> applications, visa applications. All right. You want to submit a new application? Okay. Does someone who knows German can tell us what this says just for fun? It's something like you need a new 
you need a new version of the software to use this feature, like just for the fun of it. We didn't may need to do some more translating. We are updating to the new software version. It's currently not possible to create new requests. Okay, so the visa, Shenzhen visa application. All right, let's look for this guy's file and see if he didn't get in some other way. Okay, so Razarao Forest. Born, does it say, when was he born? 1954. All right, well, here's his data. He was rejected. Oh, look, it's his fingerprint. Okay, well, let's take a look. So he should not be in Germany. He should not be in Germany. Let's see if his fingerprint matches what we found, what the autopsy criminal report found. All right. Here's our fingerprints. And look at that. Look at that fingerprint. I'll switch back and forth so you can see. I guess I can probably put them side by side. I don't know how well you can see that. Let me. Now, when we played Gumshoe, we learned a little bit about identifying fingerprints. Yeah, I'm trying to think what would be the... There was whirls, there was double whirls. I'm thinking if I can zoom in here. Okay, here's a bit zoomed in. And then... It's a little hard to see because there's some black here, but I believe that that is the same fingerprint. Uh, how would we... What would be the best way to do to be sure? That is the same. Hmm. Sure looks similar, but now I'm not so sure. What? What, what what do we see identifiable here? I'm looking at... If you look in the center, we've got a little loop and then a line. Oh, but the center's all... The center's hard to see here. The center here's got this black stuff. It's a little hard to see. So I'm looking for something else. Like... Right, let's go down here. Um, I'm looking at this area here. You probably have a hard time seeing it on that monitor. There's a line and then a I forget what that's called in gumshoe, but it sure looks like that area. And then I 
I see this other area here. Yeah, that's going to be the same fingerprint. I'm, I'm concluding it's the same fingerprint. I'm just, it's not exact, which is nice. When you play gumshoe, the fingerprint matches were exact. This is as more what you would expect, which is, you know, you, you put the fingerprint down, it's going to come off a little different, a little blurry. Um, but I'm just looking for little places where there are these little odd loops. And I'm concluding that they are the same. You see there's a, there is a little, this is giving me a little bit of pause. There's a little bit of a, um, I can't tell, are those like scars here? Like a little V of scar tissue, which I don't really see on the laptop one. But it's hard to know if that's a scar or just not, it just didn't print entirely correctly. But the other pieces of this where it sort of loops and comes back like little Y's, there's a line. Let's see, where is that? Near the top. A little tricky. Can you guys see? Let's see. I'm trying to see what's the best way to. So there's a little Y here. Can you see how like there's a line that goes and then it splits around it? And I'm trying to find that. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But, uh, boy, it looks similar. Let's, um, let's, let's keep an open mind. I think this is probably a fingerprint match, but I'm not 100%. I would love to find something definitive where I look at it and I say that's obviously couldn't be anything else but fairly sure it's the same signature same fingerprint all right so Is there anyone else? Should we look up? Um, should we look up a visa for our guy, Fyodor Chernov? Chernov? Should we see if he's got a visa entry in that system while we're here?
P-S-C-H-E-R-N-O-W, Theodore. On, I guess, on his autopsy, date of birth, 1990. We knew that already. Okay, let's see if he's in here. Well, he is in here. That's definitely him from our other photo. Lisa. Oh, there's his fingerprint. Well, uh, let's just write down that we have his fingerprint in case it comes up again. They already checked fingerprint. Just to double check. It definitely doesn't match any of the fingerprints we found, but that's to be expected. He was approved August 2018. All right, it doesn't give us any new information, but now what, maybe this is a good time to follow up with this thing. There he is, we know that's him. It does say translate, so I think it's time for us to try to translate this. So let's see, I don't know how to, I've got, it's an image, so I don't know quite how to translate it, but maybe if we search this website, www.saveirena. Are you? Let's see what we got here. Well, that's interesting. What have we got here? Okay, can we translate this, please? Okay. What have we got? This site is dedicated to my daughter, Irina, and the search for justice. My name is Boris Razorov, and I dedicate this site to my daughter, Irina. Uh, let me read this in a second. Can I just make an uh, observation here for a second? The name on the passport says Razorow. And here he says, my name is Boris Razorov. When we searched, we searched for Razorow. Do we need to search for Razorov? Like, has he got an alias? Let me just quickly, before we finish reading this. Uh, I'm going to keep this open. I don't think that's going to be anything, but I want to make sure he doesn't sneak through. And what is this arranged meeting? Unfortunately, it's currently not possible to make arrangements. Okay, that's fine. Let's see what else we... Oh, sorry. I want to share this with you. So I, I clicked on arrange a meeting. It said it's not possible to do this. German consulate. Opening hours. Maria Aberhold. Okay. Anyway, let's. Oh, do we have to re log in again? Really? All right. I just want to make sure he's not uh, come in under a visa under an alternate name. So I guess we got to do this again.
It's got passwords from our previous game. All right. Now, we searched for Razorel, but now I don't want to search for Razorov for us. Nineteen fifty four, was it? Yes, nineteen fifty four. No, okay. All right, well, it's worth a try. Let's go back. Okay, Razorov, I dedicated the site to my daughter Irina. On the night of August 1920, and he tried to get into Germany four days before that, four days after that, my daughter, who just turned 27 years old, turned from a cheerful person into a disabled person, bedridden, wrapped in catheters, medical devices. From that moment on, she will never be able to return to normal life. She dreamed of becoming a doctor, so she entered the medical institute where she studied with her fiancé. We went to school together and we're going through life together and in a week they were supposed to have a wedding. This site is not for fundraising or seeking sympathy. It's to punish the culprit. And this is the footballer of the local club Neva, Fyodor Chernov. Again, different, diff slightly different name. On that unfortunate night, she was in a club with friends where, unfortunately, he ended up too. By an absurd coincidence, it was he who drove her home after the party, sitting drunk behind the wheel. Not far from the club, Chernov crashed into a lamppost when doctors arrived at the scene. Irina practically did not breathe. Chernov simply ran away. As is often done in our country, the criminal case was closed. Everything was presented in such a way that Irina herself was driving drunk, but I know that is not so. I know exactly who is to blame for the accident. I'm 65 years old. I gave all my years for the good of the country. I worked for 40 years and continue to work at the rocket mush plant. Why can't I get the truth? Why is justice on the side of the one who has money and connections? I ask everyone to spread this information and help me do justice. The evil he has done will be punished. All right. Well, we've got a bona fide suspect now, at least. And... We could try to translate this, but basically we know he's saying this guy murdered my daughter. Have you seen him or whatever? So I'm going to write down that um, Fyodor Chernow also has a Russian name I, uh, or whatever. He's got an alternate name, which is Chernow. And then on Boris, I'm going to write down Boris's alternate name Razorov okay so um, August 19th 2018 is when she was fined and his visa was August 28th 2018 so he basically escaped right into Germany Um, okay. While we are doing website stuff, what if we continue and look at this yacht event and see if we can see anything interesting at this website? I'm going to keep these open. Adler Arena. Okay. Welcome to the Adler Marina. Here you can discover the calm beauty of the still lake with our sailing yachts and motorboats. Feel free to contact us for more information. Marina Watt Yacht Club. We could chat with an agent. Okay, what happens if you do that? <laughs> Look at this for craziness. 
Hello and welcome to our website. My name is Mark. I can help you with any information you may require concerning our Yacht Club. We have received many inquiries since the recent tragic events at Still Lake. If you represent a media company or involved in the investigation, press 1 to be connected to our press agency. For all other inquiries, press 2. Alright, an automated bot. Alright, let's just go ahead and try 1. My name is Katerina Witt and I am the press agent for the Still Lake Yacht Club. In accordance with the regulations, we cannot answer anonymous inquiries. Pre please provide your name. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, well, we've got a press pass. Look at this. Don't forget. Yeah. Let's... Let's type Carl Novak. I mean, he's been arrested. I'm not sure what will happen. Let's see what she says. It's nice to meet you, Carl Novak. Do I understand correctly that you would like to receive information regarding the case of the murdered Russian football player? <laughs> yes. We're only able to provide information about the yachts, which is permitted by the law. If you need inform, Sorry. If you need information... About the movement of the yachts, you can find it by looking into various community-based projects that deal with recording ship movements. Are you interested to get more information? Yes. How would you like to get the information? Type name for yacht name or IMO for the number. Okay, so just to remind you, on the yacht pages that we have we've got IMO numbers for each of the ships and then we also have different information for different ships that are docked at the Adwer Marina these are yachts these are sailboats or maybe yachts too so we can get information on these or these this is type sailboat. So this diagram is just for sailboats. Which we don't know why that's relevant for us. Because these boats, these sailboats, don't seem to be all that relevant for us. Okay, well, just for the hell of it, let's get information about Jana Stable's boat. Since she's the one who happens to be Adam... Nachlin's secretary. So I'm going to type name. What is the name of the yacht? Andiama. Let's see what she says. The indicated day refers to the 10 meter yacht Andiamo, IMO number 1052769. Okay, let's see if we can match that with the IMO numbers. Where's our chart here? All right. There's our chart. Jonathan says he thinks one boat was rented under Adam's wife's name. Nicotina, yes, you're right. That's a good catch. So, Nicotina. Just to remind you. Adam Nachlin and his 31-year-old girlfriend, Natalina Nicotina, tied the knot. So, let's add another. This is a good... Um, reminder to write down notes. So Nicotina is the wife. So we've got two boats that are two yachts in Adwerstein that that are people that we recognize. Um, all right, let's not let's not um, get diverted though. If we look up. 
We've got the IMO information for boats. So I'm going to make another page for yachts. Okay. This is the Andiamo. Andiamo, which is owned by Stable. Okay, what's the IMO here? 105-2769-2769 and then MMSI 530-537-071-1475. Does that match up with any of our sailboats? We don't think it should, but maybe we're misunderstanding. Yes, we must be misunderstanding because it sure does. It matches up with this boat here. So let's make a note, that's the Andiamo stable boat, okay. All right, let's look up the other one. Yes. Name. This one is the Destiny. Uh, if I type in destiny, it says we don't rent this yacht at the Adorstein Yacht Club. Please enter another yacht name or IMO number. Okay, let's do the rest of these while we're here. Escape. We don't rent this yacht. Let me type in Andiamo again. I want to make sure. Andiamo. What's going wrong? What am I doing wrong? Uh, why Andiamo. I'm just doing Andiamo again to verify that it's working as expected, but it's not. What am I missing? Type in an IMO one oh five two seven six nine. What am I what am I doing wrong here? It's like it's in a different it's in a loop that it sh that it shouldn't be in. Let's try again. I'm gonna reload this page. One, two for other inquiries. Office is quote. Okay, Crescent. Okay. Okay. What if we just give a weird name, Mike Boris? Doesn't care what we put in. Okay. Yes. Are you interested in getting more information about the yachts? Yes. Type name for yacht name where I am. Okay, so we got to type. Maybe that's what I had to do. I had to type name each time. Okay, let's just make sure now. Name is the destiny. Okay, here we go. Destiny. Nicotina's boat. Okay. One oh eight five. Seven eight one oh eight five seven 
0.08 MSI 5K1 Wow 5K8165 If we match that up Which boat is that? 108.5708. It's this boat here, which I've marked as green. So that's Destiny Nikita. Point at the green boat. So do we want information about another yacht? We say yes. Ah, okay, good. All right, so let's get the rest of these. We might as well, right? Um, okay, let's try the boat type name. Alfonsi. We don't rent this yet. Yeah, it seems to be getting stuck, so I guess I have to redo it after we give it a boat. Okay, next name is the Alfonsi. Alfonsi, we don't rent this yacht. Okay. Let's try on the Almo again. The Almo it goes. I'm trying to figure out how to... Yes. Name. It's confused now. <laughs> okay, one boat at a time. Oh, I typed in the renter's name. All right, the boat's name is Escape. Okay. So the Escape, which is owned by Alfonsi, which we don't recognize the name of. Okay. 104 uh, if someone wants to look up for fun what IMO and MMSI mean for boats just for the fun of it, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Or I can do it. Alright, let's see if we can identify what boat this is on our little list here. 1046750. Oh, 1046750. Oh, okay, that is a boat on our list. It's the. One, two, three. The third boat is red. This is the escape. Okay. Let's see if we can convince it to get us more information. Name. All right, next name is the spirit. Jonathan says, if there's an IMO number that does not match 
on boat route chart, you can reverse search to get boat name. Yes, I think. And in fact, we don't know for sure that putting in a, an IMO number doesn't get us different information. So we are going to try that. But yes, I agree with you that that's what we'll do. Okay. Um, the next one is the Spirit, which is owned by Muir. And it's got 101, Let's see if we can identify this one. 102148, that's also on our list. It's the black, it's the fourth boat. Black is the spirit. So we now have identified all four of these boats, who they belong to. One belongs to the stable family. One belongs to Nicotina. Two, we don't quite understand. We don't have any reason to suspect. And then we've got a boat here that has looks like it hasn't been uh, traveling. But I guess we could just put it in here just for the hell of it. So the moon, which is owned by Herzog. Oh. Okay, let's just confirm that that one, two, three, four, five, yeah, and only four sailing. Okay, so I think we're just going to find that this one has not been seen traveling. Yes, okay, that's that's fine. Nothing wrong with any of that. Um, let's put in an ISO, even though we've identified all of these sailboats. Let's put in one of the uh, IMOs just to make sure it doesn't give us different information. So we're going to type IMO. And I'll just put in the uh, Destiny one one o eight five seven o eight. The indicated data refers to the 10 meter yacht Destiny IMO, whatever. Did we know that how big they are on any other information? No. So we could get information about, we could write down how big each of these are. The Spirit is 12 meter. The Escape is 11 meter. 10, 11, 12, they're all in the same range. Jonathan reports, the IMO is International Maritime Organization and, Mar and MMSI is Maritime Mobile Service Identity. Looks like IMO number is Ship Unique Permanent ID number. Okay, makes sense. All right. Um, is there any more information we can get from here? I mean, that was pretty cool that we were able to line up these travel records with the owners so we can now track their, which owner, but um, obviously my first pass through this must have misunderstood the significance of something because it looked like they all couldn't be there, but obviously there's something we're doing wrong or it's a way to rule out all of these people. I'm not sure. Let's, um, let's see, is there any other website information that we want to go to that we haven't done yet? I do notice something here. The press uh, credentials has a Dorf Park 
web address. So while we're going on this kick of websites, let's go to this website and see if we can learn more about Dorfbeck. Okay, let's open a new tab for this. Dorf Park. Mm, I don't think we want Google to translate it. We want the web page to translate it. Okay. An oasis of exclusive relaxation, Village Park. Dorf Park is an innovative private members club inspired by the key elements that we believe contribute to a successful lifestyle. Health, business, entertainment. Outdoor and indoor pools. Natural spring water. <laughs> Look at that. Natural spring water. Is he going to have been killed in here? In one of their spring water, freshwater pools? I think there's a good there's a good likelihood. Private yacht harbor, direct access to the marina. Exclusive venue. Members only VIP club. Privacy is protected. Always open 24 hours a day. Executive member club and look, it's right near the marina. Okay. Jonathan says, some more facts. IMO goes with ship forever, even if sold to someone in a different country. MS, MMSI looks like universal code to communicate between ships. Interesting. All right. I think we're getting a feel for what's going on here. I think he's going to be killed in one of these freshwater pools. But let's see what happens if we try to become a member. Membership registration for this year is finished. Thanks for your interest. Can't join. All right. So basically, it looks like the only thing for us on this page is to see how close it is to the marina and to catch this little part about their spring water pools. All right. Let us We've got another suspect we haven't started to look at yet. That's our Twitter person. I think those are the only documents that we haven't Oh no, we haven't studied the footballer page yet. Well, let's look at this for a second, because I'm not sure I understand how to what to make sense of this. So there's our guy. He's worth $32 million. That's the lowest of everyone. Everyone's worth a lot of money. $50 million. Now, let's look at the transfer fees, though. Six million fifty nine fifty seven forty loan of nine million loan eight million thirty eight million. So he was saying like wow that's a low number. So just to make sure we understand this concept here of what we're looking at, if you buy a house from someone or a football player at far below market cost, it's a way of you giving them cash. It's a way of you giving them... Right, if you sell something for less than it's worth, it's as if you're giving them a gift. So if I wanna give you $50 million, but I don't want it to look like I'm giving you $50 million. I just sell you a $58 million house for $8 million. 
Now I've effectively hidden this gift of $50 million that I've given you. So if that's the case, then it would be as if someone is gifting or bribing Adam Knockland, the owner of this team, thirty, forty million dollars. I don't know any other information that would be in this sheet. We can worry about that later. Um, okay, let's let's go to these Twitter uh, account pages. We've got three pages here. Let me close this up so it's a little neater for us. All right, we've got three printouts. Are they ordered? Let's see what we've got here. They're all printouts of To Chair Now Fans Twitter page. They have dates, their posts from 2 September, 9 November, February, January, December, November, September, September, September. Okay, so from oldest to newest at the bottom. Let's see what we've got here. Can you see this? Okay, all right. To share now, fan is posting these. Fyodor is healthy and ready to play for Adlerstein, according to reports from the medical commission. In the in the picture is his daughter, sorry, is his doctor, Natalia Nikitina, who joined our team this winter. So, uh, it looks like the wife of. Adam Knockland, where's our document, is also the doctor of the team. Let's make a new page for her. So, Nicotina is the wife of Adam Knockland but also the doctor of the Adler team, Adler football team. That's the Twitter page telling us that. All right. That was on 2 September. And now he's write, writing my Twitter account for clever people. I wonder if he's providing the login to his Twitter account. Okay, and here's the cipher continuing. I'll get back to this in a second and tell you how to read this if you don't know. Here's another post. A telecom along were both interested, but Fyodor Cho chose Adler Adlerstein. This happened yesterday, only a few hours before the window of time for transfer closed. Fyodor Teresh now, welcome to the family. I don't so we don't know what the significance of them doing it just before the window closed. Alright, let's look at this next page here. 22 November. Everyone has bad days. Keep your head up, chair now. That's gonna be 22 November is gonna be the car crash. Right? See if we can get that page up again. Where is that? Save Arena. So, oh, August. August 19th. So what was the bad day then? November, to, I'm going to write this down. November 22nd, Twitter. What was bad day? Was it just a bad sports day? Oh, today you were benched. But your time will come. 
finally in the squad. Show him how it's done. Okay, here he is playing center, forward center, whatever. Other people in his team. First thing that Fyodor did was visit an animal shelter in our town. Sorry, I should go back to this so you can see it. So, okay, so we're going, I guess this is oldest. We should go from here. Fyodor is healthy and ready to play for Adverstein, according to reports from the Medical Commission. Second game of the season and Fyodor's first run out on the field. So far unsuccessful, we're positive that Fyodor will find his rhythm. First thing that Fyodor did was visit an animal shelter. It's a bit fishy. Okay. Then he finally made it in the squad. And then the next day, he's benched. Not the next day, but in a week he's benched. Your time will come. Then he must have had another game. He says, everyone has bad days. Okay. Let's continue from here. Substituted out in the first half. Today is just not his day. I don't play passes because no one on this team can trap the ball, says Fodor to share now. Don't throw around words like that, Fyodor. We are a team and should stand united. <laughs> Look, at they've taken a photo from one of the games to chair now. Go the fuck back to Serbia. Fans have been holding up this banner in the stands. It's easy to criticize and insult a person, but it's harder to support and believe in someone during difficult times. I have absolute confidence that Fyodor will prove himself. Zero goals, zero successful passes, three yellow cards, one red card. Ugh. He's not doing so well. You had three months to prove you were worthy of the money spent on you, but all you did was trample all over Adler fans. Any sports school graduate is better than you. And there he is, raising his hands, saying fuck you to everyone on the, in the stands. I couldn't care less where Adler will be by the end of the season. I won't be in this hole. Fyodor to share now. And then his fans' last post. You can be the world's best player, but what's the point if you're the world's worst person? Die to chair now. This will be my last post here. Okay. So this guy started as his fan and watched him get hired and then do badly and leave over the course from September to March. All right, let's decode this thing and get into his Twitter account. All right, now, does everyone know? Uh, Jonathan says, sorry, I might have missed it, but did it say the club had a separate dock and that's where the votes were read? No, I believe it said it was right next to the dock, but let's see. Let's see what it says. Oh, private yacht harbor, direct access to the marina. So I guess it does have its own private yacht harbor with direct access to the marina, and there it is on the map. So I guess they've got their own little harbor with access to the marina. I don't know if that, I guess that means you can put your own boats there. You harbor a boat. Okay, so Jonathan, you might be right. Okay, let's talk about this now. All right, so let's make a card for this. Let me show you how this works. First of all, you can see it's kind of cute how they've made it so that you have to actually, this page continues here. So you can see it's a grid, a three by three grid. So let's draw out that grid. Okay, there's our three by three grid. All right, now, Look at the symbols in here. We've got a V, then we've got a arrow, then we've got a, oh, sorry, I'm just copying here. Then this is continues over here. So you got a square here, then a one like this, another one, another one. Okay, and that's a square. 
Okay. So here's our grid. I've just copied exactly what's here. So we don't need this anymore. All right, let's just make these a little easier to see. Okay, so they're calling this a Freemason alphabet or cipher. So let's go to the notebook, which is where he wrote it out. Okay. All right, let's take a look at this. Jonathan, do you know, already know about this? Every letter in the alphabet, in the English alphabet from A to Z, is placed in a little area. For any given letter, you can look at what's around it, what's fencing it in. So for example, if we look at this A here, that's what's fencing it in, a little L. If we look at this Q, we can see what's fencing it in. It's like a little arch with a dot, because the Q has a dot. So every letter you see has a thing that's fencing it in and a dot or not. So what we do is we see what letter is fenced in by a downward V. Well, in this case, it's the S. There's its downward V, no dot. So that's going to be an S. Okay, what's fenced in by this little less than sign? Well, it's the U. Okay, what's fenced in with this and has a dot? It's going to be this P. There's the fence with the dot. So there's a P. Okay, what's fenced in by a square with no dot? Well, that's the E. Okay, what's fenced in by this with a dot? That's the R. What's, there's another again, R. Okay, what's fenced in by this without a dot? That's U. What's fenced in by this? That's a D. And what's fenced in by this? That's an I. That doesn't seem to spell a word. S-U-P-E-R-R-U-D-I. Super Rudy. Okay, I believe that's the right decryption of that. If this was supposed to give us a message, I'd be concerned. But I gather it's supposed to be his Twitter password. Because he says here, my Twitter account, sorry. Oh, I guess you can't read it. My Twitter account for clever people. Number, 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 whatever that means. So... I'm guessing that means if we go to Twitter, okay, and I don't want to sign in with my account. This is for signing up. We don't want to sign up. We want to sign in. What's happening? Where's the sign in? Sign in with phone email. Hmm. Okay, let's try this. 
I'm a little wary about this. Sorry, I should be showing you this. Share now fan TCTS Share now fan Okay Password This doesn't make sense This doesn't make sense because if it lets us sign in, it would let us change the password. Then anyone could change the password. Maybe it's saying that this is the name of his other Twitter account. All right, I'm going to continue with this just in case, but this is not making sense to me. No, that didn't work. Okay, Twitter. It can't be giving us a password to his Twitter account the way I thought it was. Surely, because then anyone could change it to share now. Okay. So what about if we just if I type in Twitter? Oh yeah, look at that. Okay. Super Rudy. Okay. Well, it's nice to know we got this right. Super Rudy. Super Rudy. All right. I believe this is the account we care about. Or maybe not. Oh, well, maybe that's nothing to do with anything. Joined March 2016. Hundred and seventy four comments, hmm. What do we do with this? Tweets and replies. Taking photos. March fourteenth. That doesn't really help us. Hmm. Three tweets, it says, he's only made. Alright, this has got to be relevant to us if he's only made three tweets. Is this going to be important to us, this photograph? Jonathan says there's a problem with the audio, there's a hiss. Okay, let me uh, see something. Is there still a hiss, Jonathan? says there's still a hiss. Yeah, I can see it's sending audio when it should. I can see that the mic is sending audio. Right, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to take a 10 minute break. I'll see if I can't fix the audio and come back. So, 10 minute break. I can confirm, I can see it on my panel here that it is. So uh, we'll take a 10 minute break. We'll come back if the, sorry, if the stream, if the stream gets disconnected, uh, if I have to restart the stream, I'll restart it 
and it'll be on the channel on YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel, if for some reason this stream gets disconnected. But otherwise, I'll see you in um, 10 minutes. That'll give me enough time to fix everything. Okay, 10 minutes. I know we've still got seven more minutes on the break. I want to see, I think I fixed the sound. Let me know if you're there, if I have. Yeah, so we'll spend, we'll spend the six minutes of the break talking about the the audio issue for a second. Um, what I use to do live streaming is this device called an ATEM Mini, which is a hardware device, and it shows me on this screen in front of me, I've got a view of which camera it's sending out, then I've got small views of all the other cameras or inputs, like the laptop. Then I've got a little display of telling me how long it's been on air, and then I've got some audio levels which show me the audio level from each of the different sources and only one should be enabled. It's, it's either the front camera or the laptop. <clears throat> and I could see after you mentioned the hiss that even when I was silent, normally the levels should drop down to zero for my front camera, that it was bouncing up. Uh, it was looked like it was mainly in the right channel. Um, that audio is provided by a, cam a mic that's right above the screen. It's as close to me as I can get it without being visible. That runs a wire and connects to the front camera. And um, it, I've been messing with it a little lately because I've been preparing to film a whole set of videos on a little course on how to make a YouTube channel and cameras and stuff. And I may have been messing with that a little bit. So it looked like maybe just the 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 audio cable wasn't plugged in fully so it was generating some noise 
Okay. We we'll have a shorter break than we intended, but we're back. All right. So we've decoded his message. He says, my Twitter account for clever people. Okay, so we came back to Twitter and we found what looks like it's probably his account. I would have loved something a little clearer. It says he's made three tweets. Here's one on May 16th. Oh, well, there's our... There, there, that's all we care about. There it is, May 16th. He's at a convention. So that's his alibi. That's his alibi. He's at this convention. That's the only thing that's relevant for us. So on March 14th, he was taking a selfie. On May 16th, he was posing at with his hero. I'm 13 years old. I'm with my hero, uh, Iron Man. Where's his third tweet? I, I wouldn't mind seeing his third tweet, though. He's got some comments. I don't know. Wants us to join Twitter. I have a Twitter account for Call for Two. I could use it, but I don't think it's important. I think this is the only thing that's important. Are we in agreement? That is our date, right? It is May. Wait, his death was in April. Not May. Did I write, did I get that wrong? Also, his death was the at 4 a.m. Maybe all we need... <laughs> uh, Jonathan says we should look at the photos for who was having an affair with his... Uh, yeah, was the footballer having an affair with the wife? Is that Fyodor? That's a good point. Okay, look, can we... Can we can we fix figure out this thing first? Like this is um, is this just supposed to tell us that he's thirteen years old? Like it's not May sixteenth. That's not his alibi, because the murder happened on the April, not May. So it's not a strict alibi, but he's. He's 13 years old. Maybe that's all we need to know from this. Just looking through some of my other stuff here. Yeah, it's all April. It's a little weird. But he's in a good mood here. In May. I suppose if you believe that a 13-year-old kid could commit murder, is there anything here that shows us, like, is he wearing the glasses of Fyodor? He's in a good mood. On March 14th, here he is. Looks like maybe he's in England. Or, uh, this isn't England, but I don't know where he is. Taking a photo with an English phone. I'm 13. Having a party with Iron Man. The next month. Alright, I think we're just supposed to see that he's 13 and then obviously would not be our murder suspect. Okay. But that, that, that isn't a date alibi. That, that's weird that it's not a date alibi. Okay, but um, I think we know now he's 13. And so this whole... That was weird. That's weird that that whole thing... But we don't know that that's all that was here. This thing about why he's having bad days. Why did he go visit the animal shelter? All right, there might still be some interesting stuff in there. But 
Okay, let's do what Jonathan said. Let's see if the if Fyodor is having an affair with Adam Nachlin's wife. All right, let's look at these photos. We've got photos on the car. One interesting thing is this note here says they sailed on yachts often not far from where the body of Chernow was found. Can we identify that as Boris? Not Boris, but um, Fyodor. So there's Fyodor, got short hair, hair matches, but I want to convict someone just on a quick glance at the similar hairstyle. Let me take a closer look here. We've got another photograph of him in the Twitter post, so let's take a look at this. There he is again. There's his hairstyle. There's the wife. Okay, wife has red hair. Wife has red hair, very red hair, like artificially red. And here it is, here, also the artificially red. So, <clears throat> what can we confirm? It's definitely the wife here. She was seen having an affair. So that's not going to be Adam Knockland. But where is our... Do we have a photo of Adam Knockland? By the way, let's not forget, we can check out Jana Stable. We've got a website here. Uh, do we have a picture of Adam Knockland somewhere? Together. Do we have a picture of Adam Knockland? That's Carl's article on Adam Knockland. I'll bet if we go to the website, we can find a picture of him. Um, Jonathan says, does it match his car from the MASH photo? Good question. Very good question. That is a different car, isn't it? That's a silver car. That's a black car. And we're led to understand that that was Fyodor's car, right? And that this guy is was upset that he was being charged for it. Let's find that part. I didn't want to pay for the repairs to Fyodor's car. Well, if that's not Fyodor's car, then that would help rule out Adam Knuckland, which I my gut tells me it's that guy from Russia, but um, let's see if we can't get a picture of Adam Knuckland. 
It's a good point though, and if it's not Fyodor, who is it? Although, you know, this could be just a different car. Might, like he's got a rental car because his car is broken. The night, night Wolves vandalized Fyodor's car. I have to take a closer look. And his briefcase was stolen. Okay. Let's, um, let's look at this website and see if we can't get some information on Jane's stable, stable and maybe a picture of Adam Knockland. Jonathan says his internet being a bit spotty in case you disappear. I hope it's not the case that uh, the stream running an ultra low latency is causing some problems. If you disappear, I'll understand, Jonathan. Just come back when you can. Okay, well, there's our Future for Germany website. It's time to choose a new future. New sanctions against Russia. Protection of our borders. Adam Nochlin. So there's Adam Nochlin. Europe needs an alternative. Armed forces must be solved. No liability for EU banks. No EU taxes. No EU Ministry of Finance. No to the Social Union. Uncontrolled mass immigration must be stopped. Announcement. Recently, there have been a number of articles in the press filled with outrageous accusations against myself and my party regarding some football fans and Russian oligarchs. I can assure you that these allegations are categorically unfounded and false. I don't know who is behind the supposed investigations, but their goal is obvious to injure our party's chances in the upcoming European parliamentary elections and in turn our chances of regaining control of our country's borders in the face of a threat of Russian aggression. With regard to the purchase of a certain footballer, I would like to say yes, a talented player has indeed been purchased for less than his market value, but that was purely because that was the price set by his club. The deal was completely legitimate and in accordance with all UEFA standards. It's true that the player in question is from Russia, I firmly believe the sport and politics should be kept separate, which is consistent with the direction and values of our party. The sole purpose of the acquisition is to further strengthen the team of our home city and bring it into the European stage. What have you done for our city, Mr. Notebeck? So he's complaining about. So, um, that's certainly feasible, right? That... Our guy, the footballer, wanted out of Russia because of this crash that killed the girl, and they just want to get rid of him. So he was trading for cheap. Now let's remind ourselves of this little pendant. This might give um, further credence to the idea that the father of the daughter did it. Like she killed him and he somehow left this. Left this there. Like put it in his mouth and was like choke on this.
U blank M P E R Jane Sable Assistant. We could call that number. There's nothing else to do on this page. Doesn't look like there's anything else on this page. Hmm. Interesting. What is going on here? Were there fingerprints on the pendant? Asks Jonathan. Let's see what it says again. Business card belonging to Adam Nocklin and a pendant were found in the boat. No DNA traces were recovered from the objects. Comparison the fingerprints found on these objects with the police database did not yield a match. Traces of the victim's DNA were found on the bottom of the boat. The fingerprints found on the bottom sides of the boat are also not a match with any story. Okay, so yes, here's the fingerprint from the pendant. Here's the fingerprint that could be a match to the Russian national who shouldn't be in Germany. And this we don't know. And I still have um, Chernow's fingerprints. They don't look like they belong to any of these, though. So we've got an unknown fingerprint on the pendant. Hmm. The German, I'm trying to look at, it's only applications for Germans to come, for Russians to come to Germany that we're able to search for. Perhaps we need to look at those boat records again, see if we can understand them a little better. Yes, fingerprint one was on the pendant, but we don't know whose fingerprints those are. It's also very weird about bottom of the boat, side of the boat. Jonathan says, my current theory would be someone took Carl's boat to the private club dock and picked up the body of the victim. Um, 
I don't really disagree with that. My current best suspect would be Boris getting revenge for his arena. He drove her home drunk behind the wheel. But how did he get back in the country then if he was denied his visa? Um, do we see him wearing that pendant in any photos? What about her? Is she wearing the pendant? Oh, 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 looks like she might be wearing a pendant. Can't quite see it though. What about him? He's not wearing a pendant in that photo. What about the photos here? And I want to understand why this is important to us. All right, can you see if he's wearing any pendant? Well, I can see, you may not be able to see here, I can see he's wearing a chain on his neck. But I cannot see any pendant. We've got one more photo of his on the Twitter. No sign of any pendant. Well, the wife is having an affair with someone. You know, Okay, hold on a second. I would say, I don't know how hard you can see this, but he's got a fairly distinctive um, side hair pattern. Let's see if we can take a look at this together. Can you see that He's got, like, it's very tightly shaved, and then it's like a, it's almost like a C here. It's like a little crescent sideburn right here. So he's in a bit, like a little C. It's very tightly shaved, and then there's like a, it's a curve. It's not straight. It's curved. And if you look here... I don't know how well, you probably cannot see it as well as me, but he's got that curve again in that cut here. That's very distinctive. It's a crescent again in the side. So I'm going to say that's him. I know it doesn't meet his... Um, I know the car is troublesome to us. In fact, actually, now that I think about it, we've got another source of photos. There's a lot of photos of this guy. There's the footballer sheet. Where are those photos? Okay, let's see if anyone else on that football... Oh, those are just front views. Um... Yeah. 
It's not really very useful to us, but I really think that's a fairly distinctive hair pattern. That makes me think he's having an affair with the wife. I don't know how to explain the car thing though. That's a little troubling. And we should study the boats a bit more. Okay, let's take a look at this also. That's, it's a, uh, Jonathan is asking about the thing. He said he had his, his, um, his briefcase stolen. This is on the date of the murder. He's boarding till 1 a.m. Departure time 1.45 from London to Adwerstein. Does this give him an alibi? Surely it does. Surely he's not getting on a plane departing at 1.45 a.m and killing someone at 4 a.m. Right? Yeah, I mean, he could get a flight that's an hour and 30 minutes. That doesn't make any sense. You can't get that. There's his alibi. It's not him. Okay. Maybe that's all that's important. We'll look at his notebook again in a minute here. Um, let's look at the notebook a little more. Uh, do I have thoughts on the stolen bag? Yeah, let's look at this and see, read this again. Transfer is crazy. Okay, that's the transfer fee. He hangs around the social club Dorf Park, trying to get us information. When I came back from Russia, I noticed that my briefcase was stolen. It's just not my day. Um, the only thing I'm thinking that's significant about this is maybe that's where they figured out they could frame him. Like they found, they stole his briefcase and found out he owns a boat. And I discovered that the night wolves vandalized Fyodor's car. I have to take a closer look. This is Raphael complaining he has to pay for the car. He quit. He didn't want he didn't want to pay for the repairs to fuel his car. Nothing else significant here. Um, it's an interesting little thing where it's like we found his visa was denied, right? This guy, this guy, Boris. So, like, do we take that as evidence that he couldn't have done it? There's his alibi. Or do we take that as evidence? 
Or does the fingerprint override that and tell us he got in anyway? I guess we're going to have to really look at that fingerprint more. It's not so easy to get in. You, look at how serious they take this visa. Right? Wait, uh, reasons for rejection. Does this mean he did present a false counterfeit or forged document? Like all these reasons were, were, were reasons he rejected it? So are we, I was going to say, look at all this. They're serious. There's no way he could have gotten in. But now I'm thinking, well, he's, he's forging documents already. Maybe he just forged himself a new one. Don't know. Um, I do know we're going to have to study this more, this boat. It's, it feels a little bit like our previous case where like we feel lost, but then when we get down to suspects, we feel confident about eliminating everyone else except one person, and then we've got our victim. But Jonathan proposes something interesting. Jonathan says... Did Boris steal Carl's visa? Do we have any flight information from him? When I came back from Russia, I noticed that my briefcase was stolen. It's just not my day. Do we have any information of when he went to Russia? Does he mention it here in his article? Let's see. Are there any dates in this book? I recruited a security guard when I came back from Russia. Okay. And then next up is the vandals vandalized Fyodor's car. Okay, do we have a date on that photograph? Yeah, 
Here's where he got the order to the to not get any closer. Eleven twenty five. 2008 I'm thinking like Jonathan's theory that he his there's two possibilities Either when I came back from Russia, I noticed my briefcase was stolen. It's just not my day. So one possibility is that Boris took it from him. The other possibility is it's just telling us that like every time you go to Russia, they're stealing passports and using fake stuff. But I wonder if we can't... Like... This car was vandalized. Here's him coming back from Russia, and here's he's hired the security guard. So could we nail down that time information better? Um, hmm. we don't have a date on the car and the Twitter posts don't help us with that.
Well, Jonathan says Boris visa might have just been denied because he tried to rush it, had to give a reason, probably did not say he wanted to go for revenge. Maybe his reasons just seemed fishy, so it was denied. Don't forget, we looked him up in the database, and like the the total entry for him is he's denied. So I don't know that. I think we know that he doesn't have a legal entry. Otherwise, it would say he's in. Like there's only one application for him and it was rejected and he was never approved in. So he's not in legally. It's not like he could have reapplied. Let's see if we can understand this yacht traffic thing. Oh, we haven't looked at this either. This could be important, right? Emergency call registry. How old is Boris? And how old is Nikita? All right, let's let's get some date information for these suspects of ours. Boris, who's uh, who's got notes saying his documents were forged, but. Regardless, 1954, so 46 plus 19, 56, 65 years old is Boris. Is that right? 1954, 50 years would be 2004, 60 years would be 2014. Okay, so he's 65, and where, where is our little wife? 31 years old. Okay, let's see what we got here. We have the assistance phone number, Adams. That's an interesting point. We do have something, don't we? Okay. Jane's number is one six three three seven one. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Wait, one six three three seven one. Okay. It's not quite it, but it's it's right next to it. Okay. I think you're onto something here, Jonathan. Okay. Her phone number is 49163371-3160. What we've got here is 163371-3161. This is going to be... I mean, this cracked the whole case open. That's going to be Adam, no, uh, Adam, whatever his name is, Knockland, right? That's like the next nut digit forward is going to be his number. Okay, let's take a look at this. What is he calling about? He's calling about at 3.52 a.m., on the night of, when we think the murder happened at 4 a.m., he's calling at 3.52, an unconscious female, 27 years old. On Kronstadt.
I mean, that's got it. It's obviously someone who works there. I'm assuming it's him. But what kind of weird phone call is that? Right before murder, an unconscious female, 27 years old. It's not the wife, she's 31. How old was the daughter? Irina, who was killed. 27 years old. It says patient. Patient. The daughter was 27 years old when she was disabled, bedridden, in the accident. Boy, that's... My daughter who just turned 27 years old. That is bizarre and fascinating. Female 27, right at the murder time. Let's look at Kronstadt. John says there's no way the doctor was the person engaged to the daughter, is there? What do you mean engaged to the daughter? The doctor is the woman. My daughter turned... I, I took it that she was engaged... Whoa, that's interesting. I made an assumption. This is what gets us in trouble. I made an assumption that she was that her fiance was the footballer. Let me just read this again. What it says is, they're both at the club. The foot the footballer is at the club. By an absurd coincidence, it was he who drove her home after the party, sitting drunk behind the wheel. Chernoff simply ran away. How did he drive her home, though, if... Uh, maybe we do have to translate this, make an attempt to translate that flyer now to see if we can't clear up this bit of mystery. What do you think this says? I was guessing this just says, like, murderer, do you know, do you know where this person is? I think you might be right that she's not, um, that this wasn't the fiancé, although I don't know how he ends up driving her home if she's not the fiancé. She 
Jonathan says, I was thinking same-sex couple, but now I'm thinking they're LGBT issues in Russia. Okay, just as a shot in the dark, I tried translating murderer, and look, there it is. That is what that, that's exactly what that says there. That is that murderer. I don't know how to type this in here though, but it's probably like, do you know, have you seen this person or something? I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to know this information. Uh, it's a very interesting question, though. Honest. When I searched for Dorf Park, I ended up here. But it redid it, so I think we gotta do this again. Dorf Oh, that was the, that was the club. Uh, and then this was what brought us to future for Germany dot Is that what brought us to that page that had nothing to click on? I don't know. Uh, let's see what Jonathan says. I was thinking same. Yeah. It is a little, uh, it would be a little odd that she would be married to the doctor. Can you see? We've got a picture here. Of Irina. There's Boris probably here. I don't see any woman that would give us a clue. She dreamed of becoming a doctor. She where she studied with her fiance. That's an interesting it's an interesting catch. So the fiance was a doctor. And that Nicaterina is a doc, is a, is a, well, okay, I got a, I got a, I got a catch for you. Um, okay, let me show you this. Such a good theory. All right. Take a look at, okay, dedicated to the daughter. On August 19, 2018, my daughter, who just turned 27, was disabled, right? Now look at this. Here's the wedding between Nockland and Natalie. It does say whirlwind summer, but look at the date. July 2018. So Nicotina and Adam Nockland got married in July. The accident that kills the girl is August. So as good a theory as it was, 
those dates would have to be reversed for our Russian woman to be the fiance who flew in to get revenge. Let's see if we can understand This is bizarre. This female 27 unconscious at 4 a.m. Let's see if we find anyone else here. He's 65. There's no 65 year old reported in this list. Nicotine is 31. There's a car accident with a female who's 31 years old at 4 a.m. in Albertow. That's just trying to give us coincidence. How old is um, Adam Nucklin? Do we know? We know his address. I don't think we know his age, but we know his approximate age based on our photograph of him. So how old would you put him? Maybe 60s? Early 60s? Late 60s? Somewhere in the 60s. Did we have other phone numbers? Where's our autopsy and other reports? How old was Fyodor? I know we calculated this at some point. Where's his, where's his card? Fjord order is 29. Let's see. Do we have anything for anyone who's 29? No. What about our 13 year old? No. Uh, oh.
Let's look at this for a second. I want to notice that it's start of rental. It's all 415 and 416. It's like the it all happened that day and that's where the Is that because they all came for the yacht event? They all rented it just for a couple days. The photograph by our private eye said that these two are often boating around. So if we're to believe that, then it would make sense that they're both boating around on Nicotina's boat, right? Where's our private eye document? If he's cheating with Nicotina on her boat, they sailed on yachts often, not far from where the body of Teshernow was found. Hey, I got a question. Jonathan says, can we compare handwriting on the visa to the signature on the boat log? That's a great idea. Let's do that in a second. I got a question for you here, though. We're in Germany. What side of the car do you drive on in Germany? Because we were saying, oh, this isn't his car. But look what seat he's in. So my question is, do you drive on the right-hand side or the left-hand side? Germany, you drive on the right-hand side of the road. So that is the driver's seat, right? If you drive on the right-hand side of the road, like in the US, then that would be your driver's seat. It kind of looks like it. It looks like there's the thing. This is 5-1. We know when the car was smashed up. I'm going to look at signatures in a second, Jonathan. I want to... Um, I do want to note something. He says, when I came back from Russia, I noticed that my briefcase was stolen. If we look at his ticket, if we look at his ticket, it's from London to Adlerstein on, on the night. Oh, we were thinking that's his alibi. Yes, I was thinking maybe that he was just he was um, connecting from Russia, but that doesn't make sense because 416 is when the murder happened, so that can't be a ticket from that. Um, all right, Jonathan wanted us to check handwriting. 
And this is troubling me now. I thought for sh I thought I was going to find that the, you drive on the over here. You drive on the left hand side. I was thinking it'd be here, which would mean it'd be her, her car, so not a problem. But now that it's his car. I don't know. All right, let's look at signatures. Jonathan, if you're right about a signature, you've cracked this case wide open. Let's see. Well, there's his signature. Or P A three. It's a terrible signature. I don't see it. I don't see anything that would make me think he signed for one of these votes. What did it give us the background on him? There's something fishy. It was telling us how he was, what he was working for and stuff. said by an absurd coincidence she was in a club with friends he ended up too by an absurd coincidence it was he who drove her home after the party that makes me nervous like why would that be he says I'm 65 years old I gave all my years for the good of the country I worked for 40 years and continue to work at the Rocket mosh plant. What is rocket mosh plant? Hmm. Rocket mosh. I'm not sure it's a translation problem. Racket mash. What the hell is racket mash? I guess it's not important if it doesn't know how to translate it, unless it's a company name that. Okay. Can we compare handwriting? Jonathan says, I think EU is the same as US, yeah? Uh, I guess so. When did the victim arrive? Does the affair photo rule out the victim as being in an affair? The affair date being before he arrived in Germany. 
That would be helpful. The affair pictures are from January 5th. I gotta be careful when I rule out dates that I'm not reversing things. Yeah, July 2008, August. June, July, August. Okay, so they got married. They came to that. Okay, these are January 5th. Let's see the postal date on this. No postal date on this, but where's the receipt? January 3rd, 2019, January 5th. Well, that's interesting. When does he come over? Let's look at his thing. Uh, he came over in 2018. So that all looks consistent to me. And if we look at his Twitter, we've got some Twitter entries on January 3rd. That's where they, January 3rd, his fans are angry at him. January 4th, three yellow cards. So he was in Germany. He was in Germany. Well, yeah. I mean, we know this is the wife. We just don't know for sure that that's him. But it, it's consistent with the date. Does it feel like we're missing some website, some additional website information? All right, let's think about our suspects and what we think of right now. Jonathan says he's trying to figure out why Carl eliminated her as a suspect, but Carl's a bit of a goof. So let's take a look at his list. Fisher Brothers, Adam, Natalie, the fan. Why did he cross her off? Maybe because he found out she was having an affair and so she loved him and that's, so why would she kill him? Why would she have any motive to kill him anyway? What's the, what's her motive? Like what motive does she have? Let's think, let's look at our, let's look at our suspects here. Okay. Jana Stable, the assistant of Adam Nockland. No, no motive. Carl Notebeck, we trust he's innocent, okay. The Twitter guy, he's only 13, he's having a great time of his life, he's not capable of murder. Fisher Brothers, we got no evidence about him. Boris Razorow, we have very good motive for him. Fodor Tchernow is our victim. So, 
That's it. There's only the three people that are possible suspects. Nicotina, the wife who's having the affair, possibly. Boris Razarow, who wants him for the death of his daughter. And Adam Nockland, who his motive is wife having an affair, right? And Adam Nockland gets double benefit because he gets to kill him off and trying to blame Carl, which Carl says is good for throwing him off the trail. Jonathan says, is the Fisher Brothers just an Easter egg or are they tied to the Night Wolves? Does Googling Night Wolves get anything? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think because we've gotten nothing else. Football. Gang. Germany. Not seeing anything very convincing here. Night Wolf Biker Gang rolls into. I'm not seeing anything all that relevant. We definitely need to go over our documents again to see if there's some website we've missed. We should also think about whether there's anyone else's visa that we could look up. We should look up the wife. We should look up the wife, right? If she's from Russia, which we're not sure. But we have her full maiden name. Right? I wonder if she's in our visa database. What's her full name? Natalia Nicotina, let's look her up. What do you think the odds are that we're going to have her immigration information? All right, let's see if we can't look her up. So her surname. Nicotina. Nicotina. Natalia. What if she's related? But it doesn't make sense how she would be. Okay. She's 31 years old. So that would make her date of birth. Eighty seven. Let's do it on paper. Two thousand eighteen minus thirty one seven eight. Nineteen eighty seven. Eighteen, twenty eight, thirty one, nineteen eighty seven. Holy cow, we found her. <laughs> Look at that. Come on. How you 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 gotta give this game some credit for some of those things. Okay, so 
I calculated her date of birth based on this being 31 years old and the date here, 2018. Pulled her up. Here she is. Natalia Nicotina. Date of birth, 312. Applied in 2016. But no fingerprints since she came in too early. So that looks like it's not useful to us. Um, hmm. Jonathan says, just to double check, the website and the press pass and the business card were the same or different. So there's the press pass. The address for the press pass led us to that resort. It's the, it's the website of the resort that had the pool indoor and outdoor. The business card just led us to a different email, a different website, but that was just the, um, this page. So here was the business card, which led us here. He wants sanctions against Russia. With a personal thing against Carl Noteback, but I don't, there's nothing to do on this website. It's just this nice little page. And then the, so that's this website. Although we could call her phone number. I wonder if, uh, and then there's this website was the one that was here. So the press pass brought us to this. So let's go over, let's, let's, um, Maybe there was a different way to interact with the bot on the boat site. Yeah, maybe we can go back to it. Okay, look. We have to check those boat routes again. And we should... The fact that at 4 a.m., close to 4 a.m., someone with one digit away on the secretary's website and the secretary's card called about an unconscious female... 27 years old. Just seems super suspicious. Although I suppose you could make the case that this is this giant yacht event. on April 16th, which is this date we're talking about. So everyone's out there partying. And this organization is throwing the party. So maybe it's not that crazy that someone from her office is out there. Kronstadt. Let's take a look if we can, let's trace Let's trace the Nicotina's boat and see where it was when. Let's see if we can understand that a little bit better. So Nicotina's boat, the destiny, 
is the on the green line, which is the second boat down. So let's look at this and understand what her boat did. It leaves Adelstein at 2 p.m. on the 15th. It goes to Rantau Takes two hours to get there. They dock for two hours at Rantau, and then they go to Zargen. Takes them an hour, two hours to get to Zargen. Still on the night of the 15th. It stays in Zargen for two days. Then on the 17th, it comes back to Adelstein. There, there, and Zargen is where the party is. Okay. Edwardmarina.de. We went there. Uh, we went there. Maybe we need to go there again. Edwardmarina.de. That's the Marina Yacht Club. If we want other inquiries, it says we don't do that anymore currently. So it's only press office. Please provide your name. Is there any reason why I'm the press agent? Please write it. I think that's just generic, but we'll just say call. We'd like information. What if we say no? Directly. Whoa, what's that? Is that just a different way of bringing us to this? Yeah. Okay, that's just the yacht. Um, okay. So her boat is on this island. Her boat's on this island for two days. All right. Well, what if it's the husband using stable boat? All right, let's understand. The stable boat is the blue. Let's see if we can understand the blue route. Leaves Edelstein 4 p.m. on the 15th. Travels to Hagenshoff for some reason. Takes five hours to get there. Then on the day in question, then they're there until well past the murder time. The 
night of a murder. They go at 9 a.m. They go to the party. Then they come back home. What is it we're not understanding about the significance of these boat routes? Where was the emergency call from if we look at a boat map? See if we can make sense of this. I mean, there's emergency calls happening all over the place. But if we look at the emergency call at 3.52 a.m. from our phone number, it was at Kronstadt, which is all the way over here. We could look at what boat could have gotten to Kronstadt, I suppose. So what boat was at Kronstadt at 3.52 a.m.? That's a good question. Okay, the only boat at Kronstadt Okay, that was a good idea. The only boat at Kronstadt at 3.52 a.m. from the number that looks like it's this office of Adam Nockland was this last boat, which we're calling the blue boat. The blue boat is owned by the assistant of Knockland stable the Andiamo so the Andiamo stables boat is on Kronstadt from 3 a.m. in fact let me point out let me point out, it's the only boat that is arriving at such a weird hour. All the other boats are arriving at 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m., 3 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 3 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., 5 p.m., departing at 5 p.m., 9 a.m., 9 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m., 10 a.m., 10 a.m., 6 p.m., 9 a.m., 9 a.m. This last boat is leaving at 8 p.m. and arriving at 3 a.m. So this last boat
took a seven hour trip to get from Adelstein to Kronstadt. And then a three hour trip, sorry, four hour trip to get back. So they leave here at 8 p.m., get to Kronstadt at 3 a.m., then eight hours later, they're coming back. They never go to the party. Everyone else went to the party. So there's our suspicious boat. Jonathan says, where's Adam's fancy house? That's a good question. Let's take a look at it. Predictably lavish wedding. Council member in the North Rhine Westphalia. We don't know where this is, but we could search for. North Rhine. Westphalia. Doesn't seem very useful. Here's a map of North Rhine Westphalia. Western German state, the state capital Dusseldorf. Not very useful. Well, that's the boat of the Andiamo. What about this information? Can we look at this signature? That looks a little like it might not be stable signature. Where's our... We have his signature down at the bottom. Whoop! We got him. Look at that. We got him. Look at that. Can you see? Can you see? His signature. Adam Knockland. Look at that signature. Look at that signature. There's the boat. There's his signature. Boat deposit. Adam Nachlin's signature. We caught him. The signature on the PI, that's another that's a good question too. Doesn't look like he signed that. Doesn't look like he signed it. That was a good idea though. But we caught him. Okay. We caught him. It's his boat. He's just renting it under the name of his assistant. Yes, good point. We can get his address here. Okay. Bocklister Street 3 in Adwerstein. 
I don't know how to use that information though. Blockbuster Street. I think the fact that we know is this is his boat now. So is it possible that it goes something like this? Okay, work with me here. Um, Adam Knockland finds out, let's just talk about this for a second. Is it possible it's something like this? Adam Knockland finds out that the footballer is having an affair with his wife. So he's going to murder him. Is it possible that he is trying to frame Forrest by making this phone call at 3.52 about an unconscious female of 27 years old? Like pretending that it's, or maybe that's our guy. Maybe that's the guy got drunk and made the call. I guess he would make the phone call on that uh, that guy's phone call. I'm just thinking like maybe it's a maybe he's trying to set up a a reason why this guy would be drunk. We're still not a hundred percent sure. We do have the address. Okay, if you want, we can look at the map and see. Where Bach. Alderstein, Alderstein. I still feel like uh, I don't think this is where it is. I can't seem to find any good address for this. It feels like we still have lots of holes in this theory. Um, But it sure, it sure seems to me like he's our guy, Adam Knockland. Is it possible? I was just trying to think, is, is it possible that Boris has arranged for this murder, arranged for Adam to kill this person? Like, are they, did they team up to do it? Uh, but, boy, it's, it's still a little, feels like there are lots of loose ends. Jonathan says, I'm not sure what the point of the phone call was. Uh, either am I. Either am I. Um... I can come up with a theory, though. All right, let's try this for a theory. Adam Nockland wants this guy dead. Wants Fyodor, Fyodor dead. Because he's having an affair with his wife. He's the president of the football club. So he invites Fyodor out on his boat. 
that seems reasonable enough. He says it's going to be, a, we're going to talk, we'll talk about your future in the club, etc. They go out at night, he gets him drunk. He gives him sedatives, he gets him drunk. And in this guy's drunken state, he picks up, he takes this guy's, he takes our guy's phone and he calls and says, you know, I've, I've gotten into an accident. He's reliving, he relives the night of his accident. That's the best I can think of. Or it's a total red herring, but boy, that, that can't be a total red herring. Okay, so either the Fyodor gets drunk, grabs the guy's phone and makes a call, um, or maybe he forces him to, con I don't know why, I don't know why he's, I don't know why there's anything to do with this other case, but okay. Maybe Boris hired him to kill him and he has to call and confess. Either way, um, we said that if he died at 4 a.m., where is the boat at 4 a.m.? Okay, it's on that island, Kronstadt. Maybe he's meeting up with the uh, delivering him to this guy, to Boris, who's waiting for him at Kronstadt. Either way, he gets killed at Kronstadt, drowned, pushed over, and drowns. He gets sedated, pushed over at Kronstadt after making that phone call. Maybe it was an accident. No, Sarah. All right. Then, then what happens? Then the guy realizes he's dead, comes back, How does he get back for the body to be found at 11? Look at this. So he's at Kronstadt till 3 takes him till 305 to get there. So he takes this um 7 hour trip to Kronstadt. They get there at 305. The guy's still alive. They don't leave in for another eight hours. So somewhere he gets killed at Kronstadt. But here's the problem. They don't leave Kronstadt till 1132. The body's already been found by that point. So this boat is there when the body is found. So do you think what happens instead is he tows the boat? He goes in his yacht. He's towing the boat. Weaves him out in the middle of the lake. Or the guy tries to take the boat back by himself. Jonathan says, I'm a little confused. I mean, I, we're confused about all of this. What was the point of the phone call? Uh, uh, the victim's story. He got traded as part of some shady money deal. Then he plays bad. Or on purpose or just distracted. Why was he leaving? Um, was he getting traded back to Russia? 
Why were the night wolves intimidating him? Yeah, I don't know why the night wolves were intimidating him, but it's possible it was part of Boris's plan to kill him. Maybe he couldn't get over, and so he hired these people. But did we think that the reason why he was traded cheaply is because he had just had this accident, right? He killed the girl in August of 2018. Let's find that page. Save Irina. So, I think he leaves Russia cheap to get away from this murder investigation and that it wasn't a shady deal. Carl Notebeck thinks that it's a shady deal because it was so cheap. But then in that interview, okay, so let's just make sure we get the dates right. August 19th to 20th, 2018, the daughter was killed. Okay. Then he gets traded on September 2nd. A little earlier. We were actually, we're actually told just in time, like August 28th, they got traded. He got traded. Where did we find that date? But regardless, it's within a week of the accident. So I'm thinking... Carl thinks it's suspicious that he was traded for so cheap. But as my way of thinking is that he gets into a car accident, drunk, kills this girl results in the death of this girl. And he's like, get me out of Russia. I could be arrested. Or maybe this guy, Boris, is uh, in the underworld and is going to have him killed. Look at this. I want you to notice something. Reasons for rejection. Counterfeit forged document. You have not proven you have, res you have reason to get here. Look at this. You've already stayed for 90 days in the territory during the current 100-day period. Um, one or more member states consider that you're a threat to public safety. So imagine that Boris is really a member of the Night Wolves or uh, Mo Russian Mafia. So I'm not ruling out, especially that fingerprint, which we have to have another look at. Because if it matches his fingerprint, that changes things dramatically, right? Okay, here's a new theory for you. How do you like this? Boris sneaks in. He's in, tracking down, trying to kill this guy. He sees them, he sees Adam, Nockland, take Fyodor on the boat with him. He steals Carl's, Boris steals Carl's boat, follows them, does something, knocks them out, whatever, drowns him, boats back. So it's Boris following the boat with Adam in it and with Fyodor in it. Waits for them to dock on Kronstadt. Makes him make the phone call about his daughter confessing. And that's why this phone call has this weird... What what's, The phone call says at 4, 8, 352... A phone call was made from that, from his number, from, maybe it's, maybe it's Fyodor's number. If Fyodor works for, no, not for future Germany. Well, maybe it's a, anyway, he forces him to call and confess. And it just gets recorded as um, an unconscious woman, female, 27 years old. But really, that's just abbreviation on the call log. But really, Boris has just forced him to call and confess. 
Then he drowns him. Why does he bring him back? Maybe he tortures him. He ties him up under the boat. Let's look at the autopsy report. Still seems pretty far-fetched. And then, by that way of thinking, the wife is not having an affair with him. It just looks like him. And she's off yachting with the person she's really having the affair with. Okay, a business card belonging to, belonging to Adam Nachman and a pendant were found in the boat. No DNA traces. Traces of the victim's DNA were found on the bottom of the boat. The fingerprints found on the bottom and sides of the boat are not a match with any stored in the police database. I mean, I suppose we need, we should be able to, and we need to be able to say whether those are Boris's fingerprints, because they really look like it, and if they are, that tells us that he was involved in there. So, let's try to look at those fingerprints and see if we can't convince ourselves that it's his. But first, I think it's been five hours. Maybe we take a little break here. But I feel like we're banging our heads up against this case a bit. It feels like there's lots of little loose ends we don't understand. Um, let's take a five-minute break. Jonathan has a good question about the bacteria in the pools which I don't know the answer to, but we'll come back to. All right, let's take a five minute break. Then we'll see if we can't figure that out and figure out these fingerprint things. Because I think if we if we convince ourselves that it's Boris's fingerprint, then, then we kind of know it's him. But okay, so little five minute break and we'll come back.
I've been <laughs> shoveling food down my face in this five minute break. All right, Jonathan has a couple of questions. Then I think we need to clean up and look through our documents again, maybe make a list of stuff we don't understand. But let's deal with Jonathan's questions first. Why were the night wolves intimidating him? <clears throat> Was how does it have to do with Boris? I I still I think that's a reasonable guess. There's two possibilities. One is they're just angry at him for losing for performing so badly on the football club. But the other theory is that it has to do with Boris. Um, the cat is trying to make an appearance. Really, Sarah? Oh, no, 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 Sarah. No, Sarah. Come on. No, we're working here, Sarah. We're working. We're working. There you go. There you go. Okay. All right. So, I don't know exactly, but I'm thinking it's it's one of those two. They're either attacking him because they're angry at him for for losing or because it has to do with Boris. Or it could be the husband hired them to do it because he was angry for the cheating, but who knows. Um, now, let's do, let's figure out the bacteria question. So we need our, what we need is, my, my impression was it was just telling us that it wasn't the exact it wasn't the exact area. That was my reading of it. We're going to have to reorganize all this stuff. And it feels to me like we're missing something, like some whole website or document. But, um, okay. Let's go through this. He's found in the water. He's found in the waters of Still Lake near the yachts of the Marina Club. A few hundred meters from the shore is an empty boat. They think he might have uh, been intoxicated but then they do the autopsy and they decide it's not. Okay. Okay. There is his boat and its registration number. The Mysterio. What if we... Did we try looking at Mysterio in the... In the boat thing? Let's see what happens if we type Mysterio name. Oh, it's lost again. I don't see how this is useful to us, but. We don't rent this yacht. Okay. All right. Anyway, so back to our thing. Okay. So they find the boat, which is Carl's boat. In the boat, they find Adam Nocklin's business card. And the pendant. Okay. 
which I think is carried around by Boris. Because why would our guy be carrying around it? Especially if Jonathan Warner's right that they weren't fiance. It was just a random happen to, to be there. So this is the daughter's pendant, which we almost see her wearing. And our guy murdered him, Boris murdered him and left it there. And the only reason this is there, the uh, business card, is either there because Carl Notebeck was tracking our guy. I don't think so, but it may be more that Boris was tracking him at this event or somehow was using it to track him down. Okay, so what do we find here? Traces of the victim's DNA were found on the bottom of the boat. The fingerprints found on the bottom and sides of the boat are not a match with any stored in the police database. So we find victim's DNA on the bottom, which we don't think means on the bottom inside at the lower deck. We think that means on the actual physical bottom of the boat. That seems weird to me, but okay. All right. Now, the fingerprints found on the pendant. Here's the fingerprint found on the pendant. We don't know who this is. I'm going to keep a new thing of things we don't understand. So here's number one. Fingerprints from boat. We think this one might be Boris's. Fingerprints on the side of the boat and on the pendant. Well, this could be Carl Notebeck's for all we know, right? Although Carl Notebeck has been arrested, you'd think he'd be in the police database. But maybe it's Don't know. And we don't know whose fingerprints are on this, the pendant. Okay. Next. Let's look at the autopsy. He died between 4 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. on the 16th. Discovered at 11 a.m. Drowning, he drowned. Fluid found was in the lungs, composition enclosed. Traces of sedatives detected in the blood. Blood alcohol concentration, BAC. Let's find out what that level of BAC does to you. BAC level impaired. BAC of 8%, but it's not in 8%. It's grams per liter. BAC is grams per 100 milliliters of blood. So a BAC of 0.08 A 1,000 milliliters or 100? Boy, that's confusing. It says different things in different places. Let's look up BAC in Germany. Maybe it's a little easier.
EAC. Can I convert 2.2 grams per liter? Grams per liter of alcohol to BAC. Seven point two seven grams per liter is point seven two seven BAC. Point three five BAC is a lethal dose. So at 2.2 .2 grams per liter, he's got a point. Does that mean he's got a point two two percent BAC? Point two two. All right, if that's right, seriously intoxicated. Point three five would be fatal. Okay, so he's seriously intoxicated, whatever that's worth. It's a lot of work to just find that. All right, let's try to understand Jonathan's question about does this mean it wasn't even in a lake? I mean, look at how similar these two things are other than those diamond, those things. So let's look at here. The islands are 2 to 200 micrometers in length. They're yellowish chloroplasts. The site of photosynthesis are typical. The islands are often referred to as jewels of the sea or living opals due to their optical properties. Forensic use. The main goal of diatom analysis in forensic is to dif differentiate a death by submersion from a post mortem immersion of a body in water. Laboratory tests may reveal the presence of diatoms in the body since the silica based skeletons of diatoms do not readily decay. They can sometimes be detected even in heavily decomposed bodies as they do not occur naturally in the body. If laboratory tests show diatoms in the corpse that are of the same species as found in the water where the body was recovered, then it may be good evidence of drowning as the cause of death. The blend of diatom species found in the corpse may be the same or different from the surrounding water, indicating whether the victim was drowned in the same site. So this is light microscopy of a living freshwater diatom.
So Jonathan, your theory is because we don't see any of these at all, it's not that there are different species and these are different species, it's that these are the diatoms and they would be found in any part of Still Lake, maybe different species, but different things. So this is telling us that he was killed in a pool. Now I'm starting to wonder if that's right, and that uh, I think I might be convincible that this means he wasn't killed in the lake itself. If that's true, now I am starting to wonder if we need to know what's in Kronstadt. Like, is that house in Kronstadt? Okay, I'm going to add to my mystery list the things we don't understand is where drown um, diatom evidence. Okay, now I do want to know if this house was in that area. A luxurious country house owned by Adam. I'll put that again in our mystery. Where is the Knockland house. Okay, as you point out, we do have a other address for him. It's here. Bachlerstrad 3, Alderstein. But it says Alderstein, not Kronstadt. Here's Alderstein. Here's Kronstadt. So I think we have to assume the house is in Alderstein. All right, let's continue going through our documents and writing down stuff we don't understand. Okay. Here's another thing. Where is business card from? In other words, how did he get that? Where is the what do we call that? Pendant. Where is the pendant from? And what does it say? U M P E R. Your you are my perfect something. Words and perfect, okay. All right, let's continue through going through our documents and try to figure out what we don't know. All right. We've got, check the mailing address. Jonathan says, check the mailing address of the package against the business card. Maybe package was delivered to work. Check the mailing address of the package to his work. Well, let's see where, oh, I see, yes. What's this business card work? Business is at Nordic Business Center, Schwerenster 78, Adwerstein. Different address, but also Adwerstein. I wonder if they could be, if that restaurant was where they were going to. 
All right, but let's continue for a minute going through all of our evidence. Okay, let's look at the Twitter evidence. September 2nd, Fyodor chose Adwer Adwerstein. It happened yesterday, only a few hours before the window of time for transfer. So on 2nd September. So 2nd September, our guy transfers just in the nick of time. I think it's to escape Russia. And that the pay wasn't part of any deal. Okay. Let me suggest to you this. He's going for an animal shelter to look for a security dog to protect him. Because people are, people are threatening his life. And maybe that's why he's playing so badly. There he is with the doctor. Who he's having an affair with. He gets put on. He's not doing so well. He's pissed off at the rest of the group. He blames them. Three months he spent. All right, it seems like that's just telling us about how he might be having an affair and giving us a false lead. All right. Further investigation seems to corroborate allegations that politician and Adwer football club owner hired notorious gang Nightwolves to intimidate his enemies. So there's the connection to Nightwolves. It's suggesting Carl thinks that Knockland hired the Nightwolves to intimidate his enemies. So maybe he hired them to smash up his car because he's having an affair with his wife. Maybe that's the extent of it. Nachlin negotiated a deal in the final minutes of the transfer window to buy Russian footballer Fyodor Tershnow for his club. Further examination of the transfer details reveals something potentially murkier than initially thought. The deal was brokered with St. Petersburg Club Neva, sponsored by Russian oil oligarchs and under EU, EU sanctions, the transfer fee is almost the same as the Edwards total budget. Is there anything underhanded? The connection between Knockland and the Night Wolves group has not yet been proven. Okay. Here's the page from Boris, which we should look at again. Save Arena. And let's look at this evidence. Twenty-seven. She dreamed of being a doctor where she studied with her fiancé. They went to school together and were going through life together. In a week they were going to have a wedding. Jonathan's original theory was that the doctor for the football club is the doctor, but that doesn't make sense because she came over in 2016 
whereas Arena was killed in 2018. Anything in this photo worth looking at? Hey, is it possible that this is this? That Raphael is the guy in the upper left of this photo? And got a job. His job is at this place. His job is at this club where they've got the pools and everyone. Let's see, what do I want to do? I want to put these side by side. Does that guy look like that guy? There's no mouse over, is there? Arena 2. Studying to be a doctor with her fiance. Can we look up this guy, Raphael? Do we know his last name? Let's see the information we have on Raphael. Tachana frequently hangs around the social club Dorf Park. I have recruited a security guard, Raphael to discover information about Fyodor in exchange for money. He is now my eyes and ears. Raphael complains that although the club manager pays the upfront repair costs, the manager deducts the amount from Raphael's wage. I had hoped that Raphael could shed some light on Chernov's last days. Maybe he saw or heard something. Unfortunately, he quit a few days ago as he didn't want to pay for the repairs to Fyodor's car. I mean, we don't... We have no information on Raphael. We can't look him up in the... Visa because we don't know his last name or his date of birth. Boy, I was really excited about putting these two together. His hat says Karamov? Oh my god, his hat has his last name. His hat has his last name, Jonathan noticed. All right, that would only leave us with his year of birth, but if he's similar in age, we can guess his year of birth with a few checks. Oh, let's see what we can find here. Okay. All right. All right, we're going to catch him now. I think the fact that his last name is there really makes me think we're going to catch him. What do you think, Jonathan? I mean, and it's a Russian name. Karamov. First name, Raphael, with two Fs. R-A-F-F-A-E. L. Okay, date of birth. Now, she was 27. Let's 
27, that makes it like 1990, somewhere in there. So let's start, let's just start in 87, that would be if he's 31, and go up a little bit. 87, no. Eighty-eight. No. Eighty-nine. No. No. Ninety-one. Oh my God! We found him. Oh my God, we found him. Yeah, this is going to be it. Okay, here we go. Raphael Karamov. Grozny, Russia. Application date. 2018. There's his fingerprint. Okay. Now, he applied before the murder. All right, let's check that fingerprint. Let's check that fingerprint. You ready? So we got him. It's on the pendant. Okay. It's on the pendant. <clears throat> So Raphael, it's pretty cool. Raphael is the fiance. Jonathan was right when he was caught a little, he got a little bit of a intuition, a little spider sense that this missing fiance could be involved. But we ruled out the doctor for dates. And then I was looking at that photo and I was thinking, boy, that, let's take a look. Is there anyone in there? Like we recognize Boris, but that guy in the left looked a little bit familiar. Okay, and then Jonathan, you spotted it, his full name was on there. And then we just had to guess we had a small range of years. Um, okay, so. Still not clear if you left that pendant as a on purpose or if he lost it, whatever. But um, I like to think he was like showing it to him and maybe he was. All right, now. Now what we're thinking is that he killed them in the club. And that's why those, um, those, diatoms were not even present because it was not in the lake at all. It was in some freshwater pool. And that he just took him out on the boat to make it look like he drowned, got drunk and drowned. So the yacht is all the yacht stuff is complete red herring. The yacht stuff is just complete red herring. Is it? I think it's a yacht. The yacht stuff is complete red herring. It's just a coincidence that he. Uh, I don't don't know what that those phone calls are about. That's still a little odd for us, but okay, let's continue our process here. Now, 
we still are not sure what these other fingerprints are. Logically, they could all be Raphael's fingerprints, right? And it's just we only have one of them on file. That really looked like Boris's. But now I'm thinking it's not. Let's take a look at Boris's again. See if we can't convince ourselves one way or the other. So here are the cases against it. Let's see, how can I do this? I should get like a little green, a little green thing that I can put on top of this so I can show these. I guess I gotta fold it again. I don't know if you can even see it well enough. So, what are the cases against it? Well, one case is that these are scars. These two lines here, there's one going this way, one going this way. If those are scars, they are missing from the visa application. Boy, the rest of it looks so close. All right, so let's look here. There's a V here. It goes down from the center whirl and Vs. And the thing that's in the middle of the V comes up and spikes. So if we go in the center of this, I'm not convinced that it's his anymore. Mm. In Gumshoe, you find the center whirl. It's this blacked in thing that's so confusing. That line comes down in a V and comes up and forks. I'm just going to hold this up to the screen myself here so I can see if I can't notice figure out anything here. Oh, it does for a minute. Got no scars. This is really just um, a little frustrating.
All right, I'm gonna say it's not his fingerprint. So Boris did not get in. We have no other evidence that he got in other than his fingerprint. I'm gonna say it's not his fingerprint. All right, given that we've got Raphael's fingerprint, he doesn't need to work with Boris. He's maybe Boris helped him get in, whatever. Um, okay, let's continue walking through our evidence and then we'll see if we can't. Okay, so this article is Carl Notebeck's theory about the weird transfer fees. I still think he's it's all on the up and up, the transfer fees, because he's just trying to get away from the murder conviction. Um, okay, this evidence, we now understand, is helping us get Raphael's full name. This ruled out our guy and told us about the potential of the affair. Here we've got proof of the affair. It sure looks like he's having an affair with Notebeck. I mean with um, Fyodor, but maybe it's not Fyodor. I wish there was some way for us to be sure. Is there any other way? we got lots of pictures of Fyodor. Is there any other way we can tell us that this was not Fyodor? I mean, I thought the hair pattern was very definitive, but perhaps this is telling us, as Jonathan surmised, it's his car. He's the driver. So perhaps this is telling us it's a different guy. It's not our guy because it's not his car. I don't know why he can't get a new car, but uh, they sailed on yachts often. So I think they're just sailing on their way. We know she took out her boat. Um, I wonder if we could... Uh, if there's anything else like right-handed, left-handed. Like this guy looks right-handed. Do we have any information that Fyodor was left-handed? How about in his doctor's? I mean, in his doctor's photo, he's got one hand on his leg, one hand down there. It's not really help us. Uh, the blood pressure monitor is on his left arm. Does that mean anything? Where to put blood pressure cuff? Bare upper arm. Are we reading too much into these things? Which arm? It just says upper arm. Better to take it on the left arm, I don't know. Okay, whatever. So you can figure out the cipher below the pick you're looking at now. Yes, this is a simple cipher. Free, Freemasons, they call it. I, I went over how to do it. You'll have to rewind the thing to do it. Um, I don't see anything that would tell us where, what handed he was, but maybe that's not important. Okay, let's continue going through our evidence. This document we've got no, this is giving us no information, only showing us that the transfer fee was very low, which we were suspicious of. 
but I think it's just because he wanted out. But I could be wrong. I could be wrong. If I had to pick up a backup theory, it would be that Boris is in the underworld and he arranged it, but I don't think so. Okay, here's Boris trying to get in and having his visa denied. That was a key information because that let us check the immigration of everyone and the real breakthrough in the case was finding Raphael. So we know Raphael is going to be the killer for sure. Okay, did we understand this convincingly? Not 100%. But it seems to put Adam and his wife out of the area for different reasons. The wife just went straight here, probably with her lover. The husband went all the way to Kronstadt. We have no idea why. Except if he's going with the secretary. He's having his own affair. He's having his own affair with the secretary, which is why he doesn't care that his wife is having an affair. I think that's it. Okay. Emergency call. This one has got us stumped. This one has us stumped. But, but, I think he's calling because it's just a coincidence, but his secretary is unconscious. That's what it's throwing us off. It is Adam. It is Adam calling about an unconscious female. And it's the secretary that he's having an affair with. They're drunk. And that's what happened. It's going to be Jana Stable. And she is going to be 27 years old. What do you think about that, Jonathan? So it's a bit of a red herring, but it's Adam Nocton calling with his secretary drunk and unconscious. Uh, it's too bad we can't get that information from this page. But he is paying for her boat and using her name, so that's what happened. They, he went with her. He went with her. Okay, that's my theory. Okay, this was just sending us to the Yacht Club on Zargon Island, the yacht event, to tell us why there are so many yachts going there. And that's where we looked up which boat was which and where it was. The PI investigation, which happened many months ago, is what gave us the photographs that said his wife was having the affair. Now we've got Carl's airplane pass which gives him a clear alibi so we don't we're not supposed to get hung up on him whether he really did it then we have this interesting one which is just it looks like it's trying to give us false reason why it could be Carl maybe he's just saying Carl's not allowed to go near him. oh this was maybe why he hired Raphael because he got caught getting too close to him and he got this restraining order. So our Carl Notebeck, the reporter, couldn't follow him. That's why he hired Raphael. It also gives us Fyodor's date of birth. I was merely doing my job, follow celebrities. Okay, and then here he is asking for our help.
All right, so, oh, and then here's the notebook. Let's go through that. Transfer is crazy. He hang out at the thing. He recruited a security guard to discover information. Came back from Russia. I noticed my briefcase was stolen. Night wolves vandalized Fyodor's car. Maybe it wasn't the night wolves. Maybe it was our guy. Just mentioning Raphael more. He quit a few days ago. Maybe he crossed it off so that we wouldn't, like they found that people were getting distracted into that. Okay, let us review our theory of the case. Irina gets killed. Irina gets killed by... Irina gets killed by Fyodor in a drunk driving accident. She was 27. They're in Russia. She's married to a fiancé who we see here in the upper left is in fact... Raphael, the security guard who now works near this organization. Boris and the father's trying to get revenge and catch the killer. Boris, the father, tried to get in, come to the U.S., uh, come to Germany to track down this guy, but was denied. So instead, Raphael gets in. We know he gets in because we were our most brilliant deduction was to find his record. Now he happened to get a work visa months before she got killed. She was working in the U.S. I guess. I mean, he was working in Germany. I don't know why, but whatever. Doesn't matter. It's kind of weird. It's kind of weird that he's coming in after she got killed. But okay, anyway, it doesn't matter. For sure, he's in Germany. We have his fingerprint, and we've matched his fingerprint to the pendant. We've matched his fingerprint to the pendant found on the boat near the, dead, near the body that was drifting. The boat that also has the victim's Fyodor's DNA in it. The autopsy thought he got drunk in an accident and fell off. It was only because his lungs were filled with not the bacteria that you would expect in the lake. So our now theory is that Raphael got revenge, drowned him in a pool in the club where he worked, and then stole the boat brought the boat out, threw his body overboard, swam back or took the boat back, either way, and Raphael is hoping that the police will think it's an accidental drunken drowning. That makes complete sense. And that's the totality of Raphael's murder plan. Gets a job in this area or sees him by accident, whatever, murders him, makes it look like an accident. And then we've got a whole bunch of evidence that is distracting us to false suspects. A huge part of that is that Adam, uh, Adam Nuck, what's his name? Nuck something. Adam Nocturne, whatever his name is. Um, Knockland, he's having an affair with his secretary, his assistant. The wife is having an affair with a footballer of some sort at the club. Possibly Fyodor, but possibly not. 
Both of them have their independent yachts. The wife goes off to one island. The husband goes off to another island with his girlfriend. And that's where they are during the time of the murder. We almost got distracted by the fact that this call comes in from a phone number one digit off from John Estable, the, the assistant. So we think that might be Adam Nochlin's phone. And it's coming in at 3.52 a.m. from Kronstadt, where we know their boat is. And we originally thought that was some weird thing with the murder, but now I'm thinking it's a red herring. She's 27 years old. She's become unconscious. Female, 27 years old. He calls it in from his phone number. That's that mystery totally solved. Now the wife, it would be interesting if there was a little red herring for the wife because the wife, um, and we traced their boat so we know they're in Kronstadt where that phone call got made. Now the wife is on green boat, this boat here, the one that goes this island. So at the time of the murder and everything else, she's in Zargren. She's at this party. Now, if we look at, they also go to Rantau. Let's see, they go, they first go to Rantau. Two hours traveling to Rantau. They go this way. Then they're there for two hours. They maybe they have dinner. Then they go to Zargon and they stay there overnight at the party. So we might be able to look up whether she made her own call. No calls from Ran Tao. Okay, and then the rest of the call, then Zargon, there's a fire, a leg fat pressure, and abdominal. So she's at the party, either by herself or with her lover. Um, any other things we didn't understand now? I don't think so. I think we understand. I think we've got it now. Jonathan, you say it's only weird that they both signed the boat. Uh, what do you mean they both signed the boat? There's only one signature for paying for the boat, and it's Adam Nochlin's signature. It's just it's the assistant's name as the owner of the boat and her, the owner of the dock, the, the dock space. So I think it's just that he's buying this boat for her. Like it's, it's under her name for whatever reason, for taxes or the disguise that he's having the affair. So there's the boat, the Andiamo. It's rented by Stable. That's the assistant's name, Jana. But then it's signed with this signature, which we match definitively to our guy's signature there on the website. So he's clearly the one paying for the boat. Which just leads further credence to the idea that he's having an affair with her. Doesn't seem like a subtle affair to pay for your assistance vote. It's true, but who's going to check the yacht docking logs? All right, I think we're ready to solve it. Let us see what the instructions tell us. When we're ready to solve it, enter his or her name. All right, so shall we... Let's take a five-minute break just to build up the suspense. Then we'll try to answer it. If we have trouble, we'll go to the hints, yeah? All right, five-minute break just to build up the suspense. Go to the bathroom and then we'll solve it and we'll talk about it. So five minutes.
Okay, you are watching Co-op for Two. Welcome back. We are wrapping up the final steps of Still Lake. The third case in the Adventure Detective Stories series. This has been a roller coaster one. I really felt lost for quite a bit of time here. But I feel quite good now about the last pieces we put in. Um, Before we answer it, Jonathan says, Now I think the bottom of the boat was just supposed to refer to the floor of the boat, not its underside. Remember, that was a thing that that uh, struck me when I read it. The first time I read it, it sounded to me like, it's probably a translation error, and it really just means in the boat. It was very confusing that it was the underside of the boat. But uh, I'm still not 100% sure, and um doesn't seem important. All right, let's let's go solve it. Let's go solve it. We'll try to solve it. Before the break, I recapped our theory of the case. Jonathan, you're happy with our theory of the case and the theory. We also gave our theories of the um, the other suspects why they're ruled out. So we're going to try to answer it. If we get it wrong, we'll go and walk through the hints. So here we go. I'm going to keep some of these pages open in case we need to jump to them. Okay. So we're going to detective. Okay. Detective episode three. Name of the offender. Motive. Offender city of birth and the crime scene. That's a lot to type in. All right, so our offender is this fellow, Raphael Karamoff. Raphael Karamoff. 
have. Is that spelled right? Caramel. Caramel. Okay. What was his motive? Then, don't know if the uppercase, lowercase cares about it. Offender city of birth. Grozny, Russia. Does it want Grozny? Does it want Grozny, Russia? We'll just try some versions of it. Doesn't work. Grozny, Russia. Okay, crime scene. This is the part that Jonathan was responsible for figuring it out. The fact that, uh, oh, it was, um, it was on our, it was on the website, wasn't it? Yeah, we think it was here that they were killed in an indoor pool with spring water or something like that. So what is it asking us? The crime scene. And the crime scene, Dorf Park. That's the name of this place, Dorf Park. Let's see how it's spelled. Dorf Park, all one word. Dorf Park. All right. Are we ready? Now, if this is wrong, I'm not going to freak out yet. I'm going to freak out right away if it's wrong because Grozny, maybe it wanted different. Maybe it wants uppercase, lowercase. We'll try a couple things. It just doesn't work. Are you ready? Jonathan, are you ready? Unfortunately, you were wrong. The criminal is still here and you accuse an innocent person. All right. Okay, D don't. Let's just take it easy. Take it easy. I'm not convinced yet. I'm not convinced yet. Let's try again. We'll try with only Grozny. We got it. How is that? How good is that? That's how confident we were in our solution. That we knew it was going to be a mistake on the website that it didn't like Grozny. All right, pretty good. Let's read the solution together. That was, that was some good detective work we did. All right. Congratulations. You solved the crime and found the real criminal. Justice has been served. Below you can see all of the details of the case. Fyodor Tashernow, a Russian football player who had been traded from his Neva St. Petersburg team to Adler Adlerstein in a very dubious deal for a quarter of his value. His body was found in Still Lake. The initial theory that it was an accident was called into question when the results of the autopsy became available. This is showing us a little snippet of the trade sheet that was suspicious how low he was traded for. Here are our suspects, Carl Notebeck. His boat was near the scene. Adam Nockwin, a politician owner of the football club, out where he was being investigated by Carl Notebeck for his potential involvement in money laundering for Russian oligarchs with the suspicious transfer of Fyodor, suspected to be just one of his deals. His business card was found on Carl Notebeck's boat. Adam is also suspected of having contacts inside a gang of troublemakers called the Night Wolves, and there has been talk of him provoking members to harass rival fan groups. At to share now fan, a Twitter account that was originally created to support Fyodor's transfer, but has since become a hater due to Fyodor's miserable performance. The Fisher brothers, two members of the Night Wolves, who had been recently released from prison, the brothers had severely vandalized Fyodor's car. Boris Razorov, you're not supposed to be reading any of this ahead of me, okay? Uh, Boris Razorov. A Russian citizen who is alleged to have connection to Fyodor's past in Russia and who may be involved with his mysterious transfer from Neva to Adwer. Natalia Nikitina, the doctor of the football club Adwer. She has no obvious motive to have committed the murder. Why is it murder? The autopsy indicated the presence of water in Fyodor's lungs, which is normal in drowning cases. However, the analysis of the water samples drawn from the victim's lungs against the body, those of the body of water he was found in uncovered something more sinister. The water where Fyodor took his last breath was not the same water where he was found. And then it's 
circling the diatoms. We know this because Still Lake is home to a certain type of diatom, meaning that if he had drowned there, those diatoms would have been present in his lungs, as can be seen in the relevant Wikipedia article. They were not, leading us to believe that Fyodor died somewhere else and his body had been moved. Okay, more confirmation. Uh, Carl's notebook. Traces of Cher to Chernov's DNA were found in Notebeck's boat, and with the knowledge that Fyodor had been moved post-death, it is very possible that the boat may have been used to transport the body. Carl's entire alibi is based on his boarding pass, which we found. Just trying to see if I could get the... Ah, but I can't. Oh, there we go. Okay. Traces of Ticharinov's DNA were found in Notebeck's boat. Uh, he has been trans. His alibi is the boarding pass, which we found and we figured out that he didn't have enough time. Oh, departure time is 23.55 local time, which gave the one hour time difference. Takeoff was not until uh, almost 1 a.m. The average flight time, three hours. He could not have done it in time. We knew that. Okay. Upon examination of Chernow's fans' recent tweets, it's clear that the account owner, who was initially a fan of Fyodor, has entirely reversed their stance. Their last tweet reads rather ominously with only two words, die to Chernow. Possible motive? Sudden hatred. But there's the entry with his code in Notebook's notebook as Masonic Cipher. We really didn't need that. We would have found that online, figured it out. Either by your own understanding or by using Wikipedia's page, you decrypt the name Super Rudy. By visiting the site Twitter Super Rudy, you discover that the account's owner is a 13-year-old boy. It is near impossible for a child of this age to drown a 27-year-old football player at 4 o'clock in the morning. Therefore, we eliminate him, okay? So far, so good. We were doing all this. Okay. Adam Nocklin. This one's a little trickier. Adam Nocklin is a rich and powerful citizen of Adversin who owns the local football club. Standing for election in the EU Parliament, he has a very strange relationship with Karl Notbeck, who had accused him of being disreputable and of laundering money for Russian oligarchs. Adam recently married 31-year-old Natalia Nikitina, the doctor for Adwar Football Club, and who could be seen on Twitter performing a health check on Fyodor upon his arrival at the club. If you look at the envelope provided by the private detective, you can see that Adam suspects his new wife to be cheating on him. The private detective has uncovered evidence of a love affair between Natalia and Fyodor. This proves that Adam has a strong motive. If you look closer at the envelope, Adam's phone number is provided for mail delivery. Oh, look at this. We did not notice this. Records show that this phone number made an emergency call to Kronstadt on the 16th of April. Oh, we did. We, we figured out because it was so close to the secretary assistant, we figured out that it was his, but we could have also confirmed it by that. It's a little scary that we didn't, that we missed that, but we, we, we made the right conclusion anyway, that it was his. Okay, so here we go, the emergency call. The incident concerns a 27 year old woman who was unconscious at the time and could not have made the call herself, leading us to believe that it was likely Adam who placed the call. On Adam's business card, it says he has a secretary named Jonna Stable, Detailing the rented yacht shows that Yana rented the yacht on the Amo. On the flyer, who mentions the big yacht event. After searching the website, we spoke to the press agent to obtain information about the yachts in question. After comparing this information to the yacht movements, we can see that the Yan the Amo was actually in Kronstadt on the night of April 16th. And... Uh, And the emergency call made by Adam about Jana was made from on board. We know that Adam was on the Andiano as his signature on the return of the yacht confirms the fact this matches the signature on the website. So perfect. Uh, in conclusion, Adam was in Kronstadt with Jana on the night of the murder and could not have carried out. So we got that exactly right. Okay, the Fisher brothers, who we didn't even consider for a moment, they're suspected of having a connection to Adam Nockland. If this is true, it is possible you could have hired them to kill Fyodor. They've been recently released from prison from the first case fire in Adverstein. Um, fingerprints were recovered from the... Wait, oh, from the boat. Yeah, according to Carl, the boat had been left in the harbor for at least six months for repair. 
so the assumption can be made that the fingerprints found are those of the murderer. As the Fisher brothers are convicted criminals with fingerprints in the police database, their police their prints were run against the unknown set and weren't a match. Therefore, the Fisher brothers cannot be guilty of this crime. Okay, fair enough. I'm not sure we really thought about the fact that the Fisher we would have their prints, but that's a good that's a good point. Okay, Natalia. Natalia is suspected of cheating on her husband with Adam, husband Adam Nachman with Fyodor, but that doesn't give her a motive to kill her lover. We can also find out from the rented yacht that Natalia rented Destiny. We got that. The yacht club confirms she sailed to Zargan Island for the big yacht event and remained there. She has no motive on a solid alibi. Okay, here's interesting. Boris Razorov. If you take a close look at the visa document with the stamp C1 on the rules of the German embassy, you can note that his application to travel was rejected for one year. So we got that. By Okay, so we, oh, we like... Like they're just they're like they're like saying okay he's rejected for a year that's it he's not it, but like we had long thoughts about if he could get in a different way. That whole list of why he was rejected seemed to imply he was doing other stuff. So I, I'm not sure that was all just meant to be ignored. Okay, but by accessing the site of the German mission in Russia using the access data. Searching for the profile, you also find that his application was rejected. His fingerprints also do not match those found on the boat. Boy, that took me so long to conclude that those wasn't his fingerprint. It just... I, I wasn't sure whether it was going to be exact. It, it looked similar. Okay, but there's another clue. A half-heart pendant found in Carl's boat. From this, we can deduce that a love affair is likely the motive for the murder. If you look closely at the photo from Verena, it appears that she may be wearing the other half of the pendant, which means the killer is probably connected to her, but it can't be her father because he has an alibi. Yeah, we noticed that pendant, but we couldn't quite see. I, does it, from here, it looks like it is the left half, but that's the same half that we found would be the left half. Okay. All right, here we go. There is another person we must mention in this story, Raphael Karamov. He was working as a security guard in Adwerstein Dorf Park and helping Carl gather information about Fyodor. As Carl mentioned in his notebook, Raphael disappeared shortly after the murder of Fyodor. Carl strongly suspects that money was the reason for the disappearance as he had to pay for the car damaged by the Fisher brothers. This car can be seen in the photo. If we look closely at Raphael's face, we can see a scar. All right, well, I did not see that scar, but I guess if we had seen it, well, I did not see any scar in that photo, but he looked enough like him. From the article on the Russian website, we find out that Irina met her fiance Raphael while studying at the university medical school and that she was injured only a week before their wedding. Upon closer inspection of the photos from the hospital, there appears to be only one person without a mask on, clever, and we can spot a familiar scar. It's Raphael. So not only does he have a strong motive, but he also has no alibi. We suspect him to be the culprit. So that's uh, pretty nice. I do want to, like, I want to look at that photo because I did not see any scars. Where are, where is our photo? Okay, well, here's the photo. Let's take a good look at this. Even if I brighten that up, I don't think you're going to see any scar there. It's, it's there. Um, okay. Um, okay, back to it. Evidence of guilt. After you have accessed the site of the German representation in Russia, you can find the necessary information to prove the suspect Raphael guilty. In the article on the Russian website, Save Irina, it notes that Irina and her fiancé went to school together, so we can assume they are both the same age. In 2018, Irina was 27, so we can guess that Raphael must have also been born in 1991 by looking at his profile on the site of the German... We didn't have to guess exactly he's 91. We just had to know it was around there to play around. We noticed that his fingerprints matches one on the crime scene. This is clear evidence that Raphael is the killer and his motive was revenge. If you want to understand why Raphael had a visa before the incident, we did wonder about that. The answer can be found on the website of the German embassy in Russia. Through the search of Irina's profile, we discover that Irina and Raphael applied for a visa on the same date. Oh, so we could have searched for her. We should have searched for her, even though she didn't make it in. 
just in case she tried to apply for a visa. So it turns out they did both try to apply for a visa. Irina and Raphael applied for a visa on the same day, potentially wanting to find work in Germany together, but unfortunately Irina's applications were rejected. Nevertheless, Raphael had the opportunity to move to Germany immediately after the incident to carry out his revenge. Our theory. After the accident in Russia, Fyodor's escape to Germany, along with the lack of support by the Russian authorities, led to Irina's relatives deciding to take revenge into their own hands. Her father may have been involved in the plan, but we cannot say that with certainty. Raphael moved to Germany and found employment as a security guard in the Edwerstein Dorf Park, where Fyodor spent a lot of time. He began to observe Fyodor and study his behavior, plans, and connections. He could have also known about the affair between Fyodor and Natalia, the wife of Adam Nachlin. At Nachlin's party in the Dorf Park, he somehow obtained Adam's business card, or he may have gotten it when he stole Carl's notebook wallet, so he did steal Carl's wallet. We briefcase. We figured he might. Carl mentioned this in his notes. He was also in contact with Carl and was aware of his suspicions and intentions. On the night of the murder, Raphael seized the opportunity when Fyodor got drunk and stayed late at the club. As a medical student, he would have known about drugs and how to administer a sedative to Fyodor. Okay? He drowned him in the swimming pool of the Dorf Park. Yes, that was our guess. Thanks to Jonathan, persistent at identifying those bacteria. He got his hands on Carl's boat, which was docked in the harbor near the club. Yes, we made sense of that. Using the boat, he took his body out into Still Lake with the intention of making it look like Fyodor had a boating accident and drowned. That's what we guessed, too. As a safety precaution, in case the true cause of death was discovered, he planted Nachlin's business card in the boat because his wife's affair with Fyodor would make Nachlin the prime suspect. However, he made a crucial error. He lost the pendant he had brought with Irina. He had lost the pendant he had bought with Irina, which could connect him to the case. With this information, our conclusion is that Raphael is the killer and the crime scene is the pool in the village park. Please remember that, as stated in the, in, in the introduction, we are neither policemen nor prosecutors. All our investigations have been conducted privately. All evidence and findings should be handed over to the appropriate authorities for further investigation and an official decision. Okay, so... That last little part, it was saying that he lost the pendant. We thought he, like, planted it there as his little, like, take that to the guy as he was killing them, whatever. Not important. Either way works. Um, I mean, I thought that was a pretty satisfying case. We were quite lost and confused for big chunks of it. But... Boy, this game, it does something so well. The fact that we discovered that German embassy login, like from the sheet, then the login, then we logged in, then we found the main person we were looking for. And we found another person. And they were like, oh, it's... And then later on, we searched for another person. And it wasn't until the very end when we were really lost at our theories, and we were coming up with some harebrained theories that we made the connection with the fiance who would be the fiance couldn't have been this person was it this person and then that multi-step clue where we figured out the name and how to search for Raphael Jonathan spotted that his name was on his hat and then we had to guess his year. And then when we found him, we finally found the fingerprint and the other fingerprint that was so close that was throwing it off. I mean, just really satisfying. It's almost like a textbook on how to make these mysteries. The fact that we had to keep making these chains of reasoning. And the other part that this game is just willing to do that makes this big difference is like those yacht that whole system it's like it's a little bit like the reverse of trust in the designer the fact that there's all of this information on the yacht schedules right like this intricate map with complicated stuff then there's this whole website for interacting with the online website bot to get information about the boats and then the signatures of the boats. That is all there to rule out false suspects. The amount of effort 
that they put into this game on something that's not relevant for your suspect. That's just like to help you eliminate people. The fact that they do that means you have to keep your mind completely open about possibilities. You can't, you can't do what you could normally do in games like this and be like, well, they wouldn't put that much effort into that thing if it wasn't directly related to my suspect. Like if the timeline for those boats weren't going to help me figure out who did it. So the fact that they do all that makes this game like you're always, and the fact that we on that website for visas, we had to go back to it many times and think of other ways to find people means you can never sort of make assumptions about what the, where, what, where information is valuable in the game. And boy, that's satisfying. And, you know, when you're dealing with clever designers of the mystery, um, it challenges you to look for things. Like, I'm looking for if people right-handed or left-handed, who's driving the car. So it did turn out that, that, that they were having an affair, but, like, when you know you're dealing with a very clever writer and designer, it ups your game and you start looking for things. Jonathan, what did you think about this case? How would you compare it to Adlerstein, Antarctica? Jonathan's last comment was quite a while ago. He said, cool ending. That's it, though. I wonder if he's still here. I can see... I could see a group getting stuck on this game. Jonathan says, I'd like, I like the ending best, but probably Antarctica overall. I think I might like this one a little better. I think I might put this one a little bit on top. But it is a close call. I do think like the ending of this one... The ending of this one was definitely my favorite. With Antarctica, I feel like we kind of... Um, we had to rule out everyone and say this one's the most plausible, so it was this one. Whereas in this case, I feel like... It had a very interesting pace where we were like lost, completely lost, completely lost, completely lost. Had to, we're about ready to make some guesses. Um, and the eventual suspect who we accused was not on our radar till the very end. That was exciting. That is something that most of these games do not have. In fact, this is the first time in all of these mystery suspect games that we've played on camera and that I've played recently, this is the first time that the game has managed to pull off the experience where the culprit is not in your initial suspect list until very late in the game. And the way that was done with having his face and name partially in it, but then we only were able to connect the pieces and accuse him till the end. And if you, um, yeah, I wonder if you had gotten to the end and not discovered that Raphael was the person, maybe some of those, um, the question about what was his city of birth is maybe like a little bit of a prompt to f make sure you, you found the, the entry in that visa database. It's sort of like a hint asking you to come up with the, City of Birth is sort of like a hint that he's going to be in that thing. Jonathan says, I do think there was one major trade-off with this case. I feel like the previous one had more letters and emails and journals, so I fe felt a little more connected to the characters. Uh, that's, a, that's a really excellent point. One of the things that Antarctica really achieved well is that we felt like we were prying into their personal lives. Like they were on this station, everyone was in like a claustrophobic thing and we had access to their emails. We had access to emails, SMS messages, and letters to them. So I, you're right, I really did feel like we knew 
all the all the whole bunch of characters was very cool and it was fun to peek into their little private lives and you're right we didn't get that in this game we definitely did not get that in this game so i agree there's there maybe wasn't as emotional connection to these different characters um that's true that is true but i got to say that Visa website was very satisfying to me. The fact that, like, Antarctica had the, had the email website, which was fantastic too. But there's something about the websites where you're going back to that well and getting more information. And the sort of pinnacle of this case, where we found Raphael, was sort of worth the whole thing for me. But I agree, Antarctica had that great experience of getting access to their emails and SMS messages and everything. And this felt like maybe it had more evidence that was sort of throwaway evidence or just used to rule people out, which was weird, but cool. I would also say like a rare miss of this game. This was weird, like these ciphers. The first cipher in Adverstein made us work very hard. The second cipher in Antarctica, we barely had to work. This one is almost, um, giving it to us and the reward from that was getting the twitter account of the person just to find out that they were 13. that feels a little artificial like you're just throwing in a cipher for cipher's sake but I, I, it's not a criticism like i don't mind it uh it was still you know sort of fun it wasn't annoying it wasn't like we had to do an hour work to get nothing we just had to do a little work but it was um, like we. It didn't need to be also in here, the the Masonic key. Like we could have searched for that, and that might have been nicer if it made us do a little more thinking. Jonathan Warner says another nitpick. I do think Fisher's brothers would have just confused players who had not played previous games. I agree. They were not necessary. In fact. I, we never encountered any information from Fisher's brothers. So that was just like, you couldn't have accused them if we didn't even have their names. So not only that, I, I guess, <clears throat> I guess the point was that if the Fisher brothers had killed him, we would have still accused Adam Knockland. So it was just trying to give us another way that our second choice suspect, Adam Nochlin, who was our who was our second choice suspect, um, it was giving us another way that he might have been the murderer. But I do think the game needed to give us a little more exposure to the Fisher brothers, put them somewhere in the game, like a document with their faces and names, because as it was they were just non-entities here. And I didn't even know if it was true that they were the ones that beat up his car. There are a couple of times like that in these games where the evidence doesn't seem like it's supposed to make it vague. Like we were wondering, did they really beat it, break the car or, or was Raphael doing it? And the game could have made that clearer. Um, I do like the idea that their fingerprints would have been in the thing, but there were no fingerprints on the car. It was just on the murder. So it was just a little weird. They were sort of um, non-entities and that was a little bit weird. And it's an interesting choice when you look at this game and some of the others. Uh, typically in the other games I've played, like everyone has had a motive and it's interesting that they didn't give the wife a motive. We would have ruled her out because her alibi and the yacht seemed implausible. But it was interesting that the game was like, well, you don't even need a motive for her. Like, it's not her. And even Carl Notebeck crossed her off. Might have been nice if there was a little bit of a motive for her. Although, I don't know. Um, maybe the game feels more realistic that with only just a couple of real suspects.
It is nice how the game, the arc of these games, of these detective stories, of this series, like the pacing and the arc of these games are so well done, where you're like, it could be this person, it could be this person, then you start to rule them out. Um, we were lost for a big chunk of this game with the yacht stuff. You could see, though, some groups are not going to get that Raphael connection. Some groups are absolutely not going to think that there's another suspect and they're going to have some trouble. But presumably the hints will help you a bit. I think the... Um, Another mark of a good game were those emergency calls. Like, here this a list of emergency calls, right? That really threw us for a while. And part of why it threw us, part of why it threw us is we're sitting there saying, why do we have this list? What is it trying to tell us? And again, it had nothing that happens here had anything to do with the murder. But it really made us work to try to understand how to interpret this. What does this tell us about our murder? And this fact that it's the phone from, that we think it's not quite the assistance phone, but it's nearby, so it's probably, Car probably Adam Nocklin, which we could have found from his phone number, because there it is here. That's his exact phone number, one off from the assistant. Two ways to get that information, very clever. That's another mark of a very good design. But then the fact that like, we were getting to the end and we were thinking, well, we're, we don't understand this, but we know enough to know it's not important for a case. But then we came up with a reasonable little side story and that's he that helped us confirm he was having an affair. It gave us a little flavor, background, side story. And it made sense that He's having an affair with his, with his assistant, and she got drunk. It's just a little red herring, but related to the story. Jonathan says, I also think that the boat timeline might have been a little annoying if it really came down to it. I feel a little similar about it to the timeline in Fire and Alderstein. Yeah, I think you do have a point. Um, you can see how... You can see how it's a problem for a, for a designer of this game. And you might put these in a larger bucket. The timeline stuff definitely goes in this bucket, and there are other things that do as well. And that bucket is the stuff that, on first glance and at your first look, it looks like an alibi. But if you overthink it, or if you're just... <laughs> If you just try to think out of the box, you can find ways around it, that it's not an alibi. And you can see how it'd be a problem for a designer. Imagine you're a designer, you're like, all right, I've got to give these guys an alibi. So I'll have the toll booth take a picture of, the, picture of them crossing the bridge at exactly midnight, and then players will know that they couldn't have been at the crime scene at midnight. And then you get a player playing and says, well, Maybe they put a dummy in the car next to him to make it look like they were in the car with them. And you're like, ugh, as a designer, you're like, come on, guys, don't overthink it. The photograph was there. And so that's a little bit about what we were up against. Like, the sailboats were at these locations. They couldn't have been at the murder scene. But then you think, well, remember what one of my initial theories was that Adam Nockland towed the other boat out and then took the boat back. Like if you really go out of the box, it's hard to come up with an alibi that's really solid. And that's part of the, the skill of this game or part of the practice of these games is figuring out when you're overthinking it. And I think, I mean, as you saw, we did come to the right decision, but you do have a point that the sort of 
timelines of the boats providing solid alibis were you could find ways around them where the boat was left in one place and they took a different boat. We know there's another boat involved. But thankfully in this game, at least in this one, in this case, they were just additional straws on the back of the camel. Like we, you know, we didn't, we thought there were other reasons why in the end it wasn't Adam Knockland and it was Raphael. And so then the plausibility of these alibis seem more reasonable and less likely to search for crazy ways they could have circumvented their alibi. I think I also like in this, in this, the, the judgment of the designers, of the writers of these cases about how many little implausible storylines to weave in the game. Like you look at some of these other um, mystery suspects game where like everyone has a motive and it's, everyone has this, their own crazy different motive. And it was kind of nice that in this case, we've got the journalist who has some theory that the Russian oligarchs are involved somehow in it. That was to like throw us off the trail. But um, the motives to kill this guy were an affair and the murder of this girl. And that was basically it, right? Like there were only those two real motives to kill that guy. It's just we had a couple people involved in the revenge murder of the girl plot. And then we had a couple people involved in the affair thing. Jonathan says, I really thought that we would need to split this into two streams. Well, if we had not found Raphael, if we had not put together that, we would have hit a dead end. What I would have liked the game in the end. If you watched my recent review from last week on this class of game, Mystery Suspect Games, I talk about one of the real differences in these, in the caliber of these games is how rich a discussion it gives you of the end story. Some of these games are just like, here's the paragraph of why this person is the real person. This game runs you through every piece of evidence, fills in backstory, tells you everything, how you could have found everything, which I love. I would have liked to know what this, what this thing was, what, what, what this, I would have liked to know the other half of this pendant. I don't know if you guys can see it well. It says U, U M P E R. It didn't tell us though, did it? I mean, we can guess you are my something or something, something, but it wasn't in the solution, right? It told us that it was his and we saw half of it on her neck. But, um, yeah, it didn't really. It didn't really. It could have told us what the rest of this said. I will say this also. Um, when we played the last case, remember there was gum in the original German version, but only a photograph in the. Um, American version. Here we have an actual metal pendant. And so in this one, the only non-document was that. Like everything else could have been printed out. And if you look at, um, if you look at some of the subscription boxes, which I haven't started, oh, I guess this was a little bit of a prop. Okay. So if you look at some of the, um, here was our other prop. 
you look at some of the other subscription boxes and mystery games like Hunt a Killer, it really feels like Hunt a Killer is charging a premium to have lots of these props. Like you look at those Hunt a Killer boxes, they're like, you get a hat and a shirt and a teddy bear that was found on the crime scene. They're all things to give you a flavor of really being there. And, you know, this little pendant is cool, but I think, um, from my perspective, it's completely preser preserves verisimilitude if you just showed us a picture of these. Like, in the police file, they took a photo of the pendant, and you don't get the real pendant. Like, or the press pass. You get a photo of the press pass, you don't get it in a plastic thing. I mean, it's neat. It's fun. I'm sure it adds an extra couple dollars to the price. It's fine, but if I have to choose on where, this, where on the spectrum I sit, it's very important for me that these documents feel real. Like these color documents, um, these, this feeling like a real envelope. Like, it's very important to me that when I play a game like this, that the boarding pass looks like this. But I don't need to have the boarding pass in my hand with this serrated edge. It's nice. It's fun. It adds a little bit. But if you're a designer thinking about designing these and you're like, that's too much for me, for my little company. If you make one version of this and include in the documents a photo of it, I'm going to be just as happy or almost as happy. And... If you put on a scale where the hunter killer are giving you teddy bears and hats as mementos and props to make it feel real versus on the other end of the scale, just purely photographs of any document, I'm okay being way on that edge of the photographs. You show me photographs and you say you're looking at the crime file and you get photographs of the evidence, not the real evidence. That's good enough for me. I also appreciate that some of these games you're like, you're stalled out, you don't know what to do, but every time you think of something, you're like, oh, maybe it's this, then it, then you're right. What I particularly like about this, Jonathan, when you and I played this, there were several times we were like, oh yeah, it's that, but then it wasn't. Like, oh, the doctor fiance is the doctor you were thinking, is she married to the wife. Then it turned out it wasn't the case. But in all of those circumstances, there was a way for us to disprove that theory. And that's the mark of a good game. And that's some of the most satisfying times of this game when you're like, maybe it's this. And the game gives you a way to rule that out. With all the dates and the times and stuff, we were able to rule out things. And you could imagine if we didn't have the fingerprint of Boris, maybe we would have think, thought that he snuck in. Like, there were lots of things that we thought, maybe it was this, the phone calls. Like, there were things that let us rule out theories that we had. And that, that's almost as satisfying as finding the things that confirm your theory. So I've got... One more case in this series, case four, Kai Feng 982, the historical edition, that's on its way to me from Amazon UK. It may not be here by next week, but maybe the week after, and we'll play that live. I hope Jonathan can join me for that, for the fourth and final case. That's We're playing him in the recommended order, so that may be the hardest one. It's a little scary that I, we almost didn't get this one. Um, and I was a little, I'll tell you the other thing I was scared about, like, I was scared we were going to have to make some phone calls. Look at all those phone numbers. And there were phone numbers on a bunch of different stuff. Like, what do you think happens if you call this phone number? Do you get his phone? 49163-3713-161, if anyone wants to call. And here's the private eye. 
4915487360013 You could call the assistant All right, Jonathan says I'm curious what the hint system looks like. Okay, let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at the hints. This series has such good hints. All right, let's see. So water samples, we know what those are going to say. Those are going to say if it's missing the thing, it's not in the lake, right? Let's just go to the end. It's clear the sample would be identical to the sample from Still Lake if Fyodor had drowned there. It's therefore clear that Fyodor did not drown by accident in Still Lake, but somewhere else. Um, I think it's good that I had you, Jonathan, with this because those looked so similar. I was, I, even if I had, when I saw the, the lines, I was thinking, oh, it just means a different area of the lake. But, but I did pick up on the pools in that brochure. So we were going to get it. Okay, Carl, note back hint. This is just his flight time rules him out. This is, he was 13 years old. That rules him out. Account owner is 13-year-old boy. I, I would have liked, it's, maybe it's a difference between Germany and the U.S. In the U.S., if you learn that the kid is 13 years old, it doesn't really rule him out as a murderer. But we figured out he was just like a happy-go-lucky kid. Um, Jonathan says, I, the hint like the car photo at the end of list, that's a pretty big hint. Let's take a look. Fisher Brothers. Okay. Check the statement about the fingerprints. This was the thing that um, if if it was their fingerprints on the boat, then they would have been known to the authorities. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. I didn't show you that. So uh, the Fisher brothers was that their fingerprints would have been in the database. Natalia's uh, thing is she's got an alibi on the island, which we knew, but also she has no motive. Adam Knockland has eight hints before the solution. Take a look at his business card, his assistant. She rented a yacht. It was, during the murder, it was in Constant. There's his phone number. He called from the island at 4 a.m. Yeah. The thing is, like, yes, look at this hint. All right, he called from Constant at the time of the murder. But that's not really an alibi because we don't know where he was murdered. I guess once we figured out he was murdered in the pool, which we didn't really know. We just knew he wasn't in the lake. But I guess if you're on a boat, unless we pinpointed Adam's house on the other end, but we didn't, we pinpointed an Adorstein, then I guess 4 a.m. he had to be at that club. So, yeah. This was one of my favorites when I found out that his signature was he signed it for the boat. Okay. He's having an affair with his thing. Which also, one nice part is the fact that he's having an affair makes it even less likely that he would murder someone who's having an affair with his wife. Okay, Boris Razorov. Let's look at his hands. You know that his application was rejected. This is a good case where this is what we were saying about overthinking. Like, um, seeing that his visa was rejected, especially when, like... Looking at his, looking at the file about why it was rejected really made me, I did not assume that he couldn't have found a way in. And this was a little confusing to me, I must say. I didn't quite follow this. Reason for rejection. Is it that all of these are true? So is he judged as a threat to public policy? 
And has he forged his document? Like, I was reading those things as telling us that this guy could be involved in some underworld stuff and could have found a way in. But okay. Um, let's look at his other hands. Okay, fine. All right, pendant. Okay, we translated. The pendant may be hers. Oh, do you think... Oh, no, the website indicated by the Russian fire. I thought it was saying, like, the the pamphlet, the flyer had mentioned the pendant. Take a close look at Irina's website, which describes the circumstances. Okay. She has a few people close to her, not just her father. She has a fiancé who may be in the picture. You know, that was excellent. There is some really... Um, the subtle part about, like, when it gave us the explanation, it said, like, there's one person without a mask. That was just clever. Okay, and then there was a scar, if you weren't sure, if you couldn't match up the face. Okay. You can see Raphael and Arena's fiancé. Look at the scar. Disappeared, yeah. The game, Jonathan says, the game admits Boris could still have been involved in at least planning the murder. That's true. So the alibi is questionable in the sense that he could have been pulling strings. Yes, that's all true. Uh, okay, what is this city thing? The site of German embassy in Russia will help you find the missing link. If you don't know Raphael's date of birth, read the article about Irina on the Russian website again. The article states that Irina and her fiancé went to school together. Yes, that gave us the age. Raphael would be exactly the same age. I don't think you need, you don't need to know that they would have been exactly the same age. You just have, a, have, to, you just have to have enough confidence that he's involved to search a couple years. Okay, crime scene. He was drowned, but not in Still Lake. Raphael's the murderers presume that he stole the boat. Raphael drowned him in the pool. Yeah, well, we figured that out. Okay, well, there you have it. I like... It's a small detail, but I sort of like the consistent, um, I don't know what you would call it, the theme, the thematic, the part where the case is, there are just some very small, tiny details that make it, make the flavor feel right. How the game is like, never lets up in its premise, like it's, it tells you, we're not detectives, we can't charge people, we're just gonna make recommendations. And it just feels nice. And the, the way we're brought into the case by Carl, who, who's being falsely accused again, it's, there's a little bit of whimsy there, but it, but it feels, the, the tone feels right. And I played some of these other mystery suspect games where it's like, here are the stuff you don't know, and it, it, it's kind of unsatisfying. But this idea that the father might be involved in the planning, but might we can't prove it, like that felt very believable to me. Like that felt right. That felt, you know, like we got the real guy who did the killing and this other guy could still have been helping him arrange it, but maybe not. Like, I like that. That feels like a real, a realistic question you might have that you might never get a good answer to. Jonathan says, overall, very good game, very fun twist. Personally missed more interesting location, more personable characters. Okay. I can see that. I can see that. We didn't really get to interact with Raphael. And... But both very good. Antarctic and this really top quality. All right. So we will play case four. Probably not next week, although if the game arrives early, we might. Uh, but soon after, so either a little bit before Thanksgiving or a little bit after. I've got a couple more games that I do want to think about playing on the channel. I said at the start of the stream that um, Adventures by Gaslight, this Sherlock Holmes consulting detective expansion that's out of print, that is regarded as frustrating, but um, having this epic feel 
you travel over several days for several sessions. That will have to be played for several sessions in a row, maybe one day after the other, like a little marathon. And um, maybe we'll try to schedule that for some like special event like Christmas time, New Year type epic stream. Very fun. Really appreciate this this company and their work. Uh, is this this is the same same group of designers? I mentioned their names in the mystery suspect YouTube video I posted last week. Um, let's see if it's at the back of this. Yes, it is. All right, let's give them credit because they are doing a phenomenal job. Dennis and Ekaterina Terenichev. Uh, Georgie Shugal, Alexander Chris, Christoph Kassendi. 2020. Really good. This company has also just announced a new game that they put out that's a real-time bank heist game that uses an app and you have to plan a bank heist and then execute it in real time. Real time is not my forte, but it is, uh, it is an interesting idea. And uh, maybe someone else will play that on YouTube, but I, I would like to watch it. I would like to see how it goes. Any other final thoughts? Jonathan, any final thoughts? You've given basically your final thoughts. You, very good game, very fun twist, but you liked Antarctica. So Antarctica is your favorite. Um, maybe because we slipped up a little in Antarctica, we still got it right, but we made that one mistake. It sort of gets me a little bit. And the fact that we got this one um, makes me a little warmer towards it. But um, yeah, I mean, they were both great. Jonathan says, once again, if you like, this might be worth checking out Black Watchmen on Steam. All right, I am going to go check that out. Um, I did also pick up two new games called, it's a hidden game series. There's case one and case two, they're brand new. But they look like they might be inspired by this series. Like they both use the internet. They both look like they might be a little more involved. I've got them somewhere here. So I've got them right here. So here. I don't know if they feel, they don't really feel thin, but let's take a look at them. Hidden Games, Crime Scene, Case 1, Case 2. Examine the evidence, review witness statements. This sounds like you're going to be able to listen to the witness statements. And you can search online to help you figure out things. So you have to figure out how they die and answer other questions. Use the internet. It says you will get to be real detectives. Search for evidence, validate alibis, find creative solutions. Use all tools at your disposable at your disposal, even your smartphones. So we we'll may end up playing these at some point on the channel. Jonathan says, Watchmen, Black Watchmen on Steam, is more about tackling one puzzle at a time, but have some fun websites and encourage use of programs like Paint and Spreadsheet. Oh, that sounds interesting. Okay, that might be worth a try. Anyone else in the chat want to chime in? and say something. Is there anyone else to chat? I can see. It says three concurrent viewers. So there's someone else in the chat. If you want to say something, now's your chance. If you don't, that's okay too. I would love for the designers to hop on and, and uh, when we played Vienna Connection, the designer, a couple of the designers got on 
and that was fun, but it was fun because I loved it. And with Dune, we had sort of the opposite thing where one stopped by Rhymer maybe anyway, but it, the fact that it, we didn't enjoy the game that much made it a little more awkward. But um, here's a case where these people have knocked it out of the park for three games in a row. Might be nice for them to come in and take a bow. So it's six ten a.m. So seven hours. We've been seven hours. We seven hours ago we started this. This one took some time. I thought we were going to be stuck too. Jonathan says, interesting how people just play the prologue for Doom, but then say they have a positive feeling. Yes, I, I in my review of Dune, I've been updating it, linking to other reviews. I'm really curious that there aren't more reviews. I don't quite understand it. Although you can see when you, if you're doing a real YouTube channel and trying to make content for it, these campaign games are not ideal because you have to play so much before you can review it. But um, it will be the one people, one, one channel posted a review after, after having just played the prologue and they say they're going to come back and post a follow-up review. There's four of them that played. I can't remember the name of the channel at the moment, but I linked to it in my review. And they promised they're going to come back and review it when they're done. And I'm very curious to hear what they say because you can see a couple things. I, I forget if they were talking about or someone or one of the other channels were talking about how like they were looking at their skill sets and wondering if there's how they were going to use their skill sets. And I won't spoil anything here, but um, yeah, it will be interesting to see how they react. But you know, you, you shouldn't assume that you're going to have the same experience as everyone else. So other people may have a great time with that game. I don't know, but I'm, I want to see more reviews of it. And, um, I'm curious if any of the negative reviews are going to cause them to rethink the next two boxes that they have planned. So we've got a, a new chat person, Lala or Layla Velasquez says, I just found your channel a couple days ago. Love it. No one I know likes these types of games and I do them alone. I hope I can get on your next live for the whole session. Well, that would be exciting to have two people. Uh, Layla, assuming it's Layla, have you played any of these other games? These This uh, series, Detective Stories, Adventure, or the uh, American licensed versions of it? So Fire in Adverstein, Death in Antarctica, Still Lake. Have you played any of those three? The next case, the fourth and final one they've made, which is called Kaifeng 982, which is set, you're sort of, it's totally different um, setting. You're contacted by a professor who's trying to un unravel a mystery from 982 AD in some Chinese empire. So, oh, you're getting Antarctica in the mail today. Awesome. Well, go play that. And then maybe you could see how you could check out the stream that Jonathan and I recorded and see how, how you did compared to us, where you got, where you tripped up. Um, Antarctica one was Jonathan's favorite and it was my, either my second favorite or tied with this or just, or I guess it, it's, it's right up there with this one. Yeah. Do you have any other favorites, Layla, of um, this kind of game? Have you played Chronicles of Crime, Detective Modern Crime Board Game, the Sherlock Holmes games, any of the other mystery suspect games? 
like the um, unsolved case files, cold case files. These are in a different class by themselves, These, um, this series by this German company. And then the other thing someone uh, suggested, which I do want to do, I do want to get my hands on one of these Hunter Killer boxes, which is the same flavor of this, but more heavily dependent on flavor and theme with the props maybe less on mystery solving. I wonder how many people struggled with that fingerprint of Boris because that really, that's one of those things where you're second guessing yourself. Like it's not exact, but should it be exact? How old is it? How blurry should it be? All right, well, if no one's got anything more to say, I guess we'll just wrap this up. I guess we can sit here for a couple minutes in case anyone else wants to say anything. I do worry with these streams. I always says, at work, gotta go. All right, well, we'll see you on the next stream. I'll be playing the fourth case on this, on live on the stream, hopefully with Jonathan in the next week or two. So if you subscribe, you'll get a notification about that a little bit ahead of time. Probably not more than a day or two ahead of time though. Um, and we'll play that on the stream. But I was thinking like, um, you know, people like to be disruptive and be like trolls. I was wondering how long it's going to be till I'm playing one of these detective live stream where someone doesn't jump in the channel and just say, <laughs> you know, here's the answer, here's everything, and like try to ruin it. I figure it may happen eventually, but we'll worry about it then. Jonathan asked if I've started playing any of the new Chronicles of Crime yet. Nope. Played all of the and all of the first game, all of its DLC and expansions, all of noir, all of Welcome to Red View. Um, all of the base game DLC, but none of the new set, which is 1400, um, 2400, 1900. I have not played any of those. All of my playthroughs of Chronicles of Crime have been with Greg, who is billed as the co-star. Um, but Greg has time issues and the channel is not the most enjoyable thing for Greg to do. So I don't know how that's going to go. I don't know. But my uh, inclination is just to put off playing those games until Greg and I have a chance to consider whether we want to play them together. There are fan scenarios of Chronicles of Crime, though, and those feel like a little more like... Those deserve to be played. Those deserve the attention. So my inclination actually is to play a couple more of the Chronicles of Crime fan scenarios on the channel live. Um, Jonathan says, maybe if they went to Hint's site, if you have the patience to play through the games, not sure you'd be the type to just ruin others' experience. Well, you're right. <laughs> it's a good point. Like, to to be a troll and ruin the experience, you have to have invested some time into this game to research it, to know it, to know the solutions. So maybe that's already... The number of trolls that are also in that category is probably pretty tiny. That's a good point. That's a very good point. I find that playing these games is sort of like, what, whenever you do anything, wh whatever hobby you do, if you get deep into something, it starts to sort of bleed into the rest of your life. 
Like I remember when I was doing heavy into 3D programming in OpenGL and, and thinking about uh, lighting and diffraction, like I would start walking in the real world and be envisioning things as if they were computer graphics being lit with angles of diffraction, whatever. And um, recently uh, we had a package delivered. When Amazon delivers a package in the US, the Amazon driver takes a photo of it and that gets sent in email confirmation of delivery. So we had two packages uh, that were expected delivered and one got brought up and I was trying to, and then the other package said it was delivered, but then showed a, showed the delivery photograph. And I could see, like I was trying to, I was trying to figure out, is there another package downstairs that didn't get brought up? That was this package that I'm expecting, or did the Amazon delivery person take the wrong photograph of the other package? And I noticed like right in the corner of this package, right? Like it's tiny, the package is just a tiny picture in this larger picture. And I could see right in the corner on the package, like the angle of the sticker. And I matched that up with the actual package, the angle of the sticker. And I confirmed that the package that we brought up was the mislabeled, misphotographed delivery confirmation from the Amazon driver and that no other package had actually been delivered and it had been lost. And that turned out to be the truth, the case. Jonathan says, I guess we'll see if the last case can top Antarctica still lake. Um, I doubt it. I doubt it. But then I doubted this one could top Antarctica and it did. Like, there's something about the theme of investigating a murder that has a little more emotional weight and heft to it. And investigating some historical from 982 AD, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be as invested in it. There aren't gonna be SMS messages, emails. I have my doubts, but it doesn't have to be as good. It can even be in the same ballpark and I will be thrilled. All right, let's end it there. Jonathan, thank you again for joining me. Thanks to everyone who might watch this at a later date. To the authors of this series of games, thank you for um, producing such a wonderful and satisfying experience. That wraps it up. Thanks for joining Co-op for Two. I'll see you in a week or two for the final playthrough. And that's it. See you next time.